Good morning. I believe we are now live. Um, welcome to the virtual hearing for the inquiry into budget estimates uh, 2020 to 2021. Before I commence, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Gadigal people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which Parliament sits. And I'd also like to pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging of the Aura Nation and extend that respect to other Aboriginals who are viewing this broadcast. Today, the committee will examine the proposed expenditure for the portfolios of transport and roads. Today's hearing is being conducted as a fully virtual hearing, which enables the work of the committee to continue during the COVID-19 pandemic without compromising the health and safety of members, witnesses and staff. As we break new ground with this technology, I'd ask for everyone's patience through any technical difficulties that we may encounter today. If participants have their internet connection, um, sorry, lose their internet connection and are disconnected from the virtual hearing, they're asked to rejoin the hearing by using the same link as provided to them by the committee secretariat. Before we commence, I'd like to make some brief comments about the procedures for today's hearing. There may be some questions that a witness could only answer if they had more time or with certain documents to hand. In these circumstances, witnesses are advised that they can take a question on notice and provide an answer within 21 days. All witnesses in budget estimates have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness uh, resolution that was adopted by the House in 2018. Today's proceedings are being broadcast live from Parliament's YouTube channel and a transcript will be placed on the committee's website once it becomes available. Finally, a few notes on virtual hearing etiquette to minimise disruptions and assist our Hansard reporters. Firstly, can I ask committee members to clearly identify who questions are directed to? And could I ask everyone to please state their name when they begin speaking? Could everyone please mute their microphones when they're not speaking? Please remember to turn your microphones back on when you're getting ready to speak. There is always one, so if you that one, don't worry. Uh, if you start speaking while muted, please start your question or answer again so that it can be recorded in the transcript. Members and witnesses should avoid speaking over each other so that we can all be heard clearly. Also, to assist Hansard, may I remind members and witnesses to speak directly into the microphone and avoid making comments when your head is turned away. All witnesses will be sworn prior to giving evidence. Um, starting with Mr. Sharp, could you please state your full name and position title and swear either an oath or affirmation from the cards that have been emailed to you by the Secretariat? Robert Sharp, uh, Secretary for Transport. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Uh, Ms. Burke O'Neill, could you please state your full name and position title and swear either an oath or affirmation? Megan Burke O'Neill, Deputy Secretary, Greater Sydney. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Ms. Burke O'Neill. Uh, Mr. Collins, could you please state your full name and position title and swear either an oath or affirmation? Howard Paul Collins, I, Chief Operations Officer for Transport for New South Wales. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Um, Ms. Drover, uh, could you please state your full name and position title and swear either an oath or affirmation? Camilla Drover, Deputy Secretary, Infrastructure and Place. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence about to be given by me should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Ms. Drover. Uh, Mr. Regan, could you please state your full name and position title and swear either an oath or affirmation? Uh, Peter Regan, the Chief Executive, Sydney Metro. And I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Carlon, could you please state your full name and position title and swear either an oath or affirmation? Uh, Bernard Carlon, Chief Centres for Road Safety and Maritime Safety Transport for New South Wales. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth shall help me God. Thank you, Mr. Carlon. Uh, today's hearing will be conducted from 9.30am to 11am. 
and from 11.15 a.m. to 12.45 p.m. with questions from the opposition and crossbench members only. If required, an additional 15 minutes is allocated at the end of the hearing for government questions. As there's no provision for any witness to make an opening statement before the committee commences its questioning, we will begin with questions from the opposition. Uh, Mr Mookie. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr Secretary, and thank you to the other transport officials who have joined us this morning. And can I just first convey certainly the opposition's appreciation for the work that the staff of Transport for New South Wales and the wider transport cluster has done during this uh, lockdown. Mr Secretary, can I just start by asking about the effect uh, on transport staff uh, by COVID-19? You, do you have uh, information about the number of essential public transport workers who have been directly impacted by COVID and as a result have, are currently isolating or have had to isolate since the lockdown started? Uh, Rob Sharp, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, uh, we do have uh, staff that are impacted by COVID and uh, in two ways. One is those who have directly uh, being impacted with COVID and then also those that are uh, put into isolation because they've been deemed to be close uh, contacts and uh, both uh, do impact our staff. Uh, since March 2020, uh, more than 120 of our staff and contractors who work directly for us uh, have contracted COVID and uh, all of those have uh, been in isolation for 14 days uh, following uh, their positive tests. Do you have the number of close contacts who've had to isolate? Uh, in terms of the overall number, no, I don't. Uh, I'll just pass to Ms. Burke O'Neill uh, to see if she has the number at hand. Thank Megan, you. Megan Burke O'Neill. Um, thank you, Secretary. Um, thank you for your question. That number does change from day to day as staff come in and out of isolation. Currently, we are confirming today's numbers, but it's approximately 400 staff currently isolating. Yeah, and just the cumulative total of close contacts in the transport workforce since the, well, we'll use the March figure timescale that the Secretary used. Megan Burkeniel, I'm sorry, was that question to the Secretary? Uh, it's to the Secretary or to yourself, whoever has the information at hand. Thank you. Um, no, I don't have the number of total isolation that you've asked for. I can take that on notice and see if we can provide that. Thank you. I'd appreciate that. Can I just ask, of that 120 and 400, how many of them are like bus drivers, train drivers? Can you give us a bit more information about precisely whom in the transport workforce have had to uh, currently isolate? Megan Burke O'Neill, um, around 400, uh, sorry, the vast majority of that approximate number I've given you for today are operational staff. I don't have the breakdown across the different modes. I will just ask our Chief Operations Officer, Mr Collins, if he can add to my answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Howard Collins. The, um, I can't give you the precise number, but we know that uh, over a dozen bus operators um, split between STA and private, a number of different operational and engineering workers, but the number is relatively low. I can take on notice and give you those uh, numbers in detail, but um, it is also includes office workers, other people who have not been at work for the, in, and working from home, um, and generally uh, the number is about two-thirds operational, one-third operational. There are a number of construction workers as well who have uh, been uh, positive and they have isolated. Thank you. Okay, thank you. If that's possible, we can get that on notice. That would be appreciated, Mr. Collins. Thank you very much. Mr. Secretary, does Transport for New South Wales considered a rapid antigen testing regime across the transport network for its staff and its workforce? Rob Sharp, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, we have uh, deployed rapid antigen testing as part of uh, the process that we've deployed to protect our staff. Uh, we have a number of uh, layers of activities to protect our staff during COVID, including uh, protective barriers, uh, sanitizers, masks, 
and uh, in regards to the recent public health orders for workers from uh, the lockdown areas, particularly uh, the authorised workers, uh, rapid antigen testing has uh, been deployed. Is it still being deployed, Mr Secretary? Yes. And what's the cost to the Transport Department for rolling establishing it? Uh, I'd have to refer that to uh, uh, Ms Burke O'Neill. Do we have the information at hand or do we need to take it on notice? Megan Burke O'Neill, I believe we'll have to take it on notice. I will do a check in with um, Mr Collins. Thank you. If you could take it on notice, that's fine. And maybe come back yes. if you get the information, that would be great. Um, Mr Secretary, is the rapid antigen testing still being implemented? Uh, Rob Sharp. Yes, it is. Uh, the uh, rapid antigen testing is uh, being deployed. We we do have it up and running in uh, one or two locations, and the plan is to put it into uh, core areas uh, where we have uh, the need to have large numbers of staff come through and be tested. Were you intending to roll out rapid antigen testing across all work sites earlier this week or last week in response to the health order that was in effect at the time? Uh, when the health order uh, was issued, uh, transport was reviewing its uh, procedures and uh, rapid antigen testing uh, was part of the uh, arsenal to allow authorised workers to come in and uh, operate the uh, trains, buses, networks. So uh, the point at which we started uh, to actually uh, deploy was uh, when that public health order came out, along with uh, many others across multiple industries. Sure. And so were you effectively scrambling to ensure that the Transport Department was complying with the health orders? Uh, transport has a, a number of health uh, providers that we've worked with throughout COVID, and uh, those health providers are quite large national organisations. Uh, so we were able to uh, work with our partners and to, uh, to pull those uh, uh, supplies and processes in place. Uh, we're also been able to work with uh, our health uh, cluster quite closely in terms of uh, procedures uh, that we were able to leverage, and uh, that certainly assisted in terms of being able to implement procedures in uh, reasonable much, quick timeframes. How much notice were you given about the decision to reverse the order to require rapid antigen testing? Uh, tra transport has internally a task force uh, which works uh, around the clock uh, on supporting the operation and keeping the operation going. That task force has daily meetings with, uh, with health and uh, so uh, in terms of advice, uh, obviously we get the formal public health order along with everyone else in terms of the specifics, uh, but we were able to uh, uh, find out a couple of days earlier that uh, changes may occur, and uh, that was uh, able to be then fed into our task force. Were you instructed to cease planning for rapid antigen testing? Uh, no, we weren't, uh, Mr. Mookie. Mookie, that's all right. Thank Mookie. you. Um, can we talk about um, just on moving on to the sort of subject of the reduction in the timetable as a result of COVID? Uh, Given that we're operating on a reduced timetable right now, and that is having an effect on essential workers, especially healthcare workers' ability to access their workplace, uh, why has it been essential to reduce this timetable? And are you concerned that this is creating unnecessary distress for people who are trying to get to hospitals and other sites to assist in the response to COVID? Uh, Rob Sharp, uh, thank you for that question. The uh, the duality of COVID. Uh, in the current lockdown and the Delta strain is that we were needing to deliver essential services at the same time providing a transport solution that uh, limited mobility and uh, that has been a balancing act. I'll pass over to uh, Mr Collins who's been intimately involved with the uh, dynamic scheduling uh, to answer the specifics of your question. The specifics, Mr. Sharp, of the question was more directed to you. Um, I appreciate the operational detail um, that Mr. Collins might be able to provide, but the question was direct. Uh, are you concerned that as a result of this reduced timetable that it's impacting on the ability of essential healthcare workers to be able to travel to their workplaces? Uh, thank you for that clarification. Uh, the 
the balance that I talked about uh, is being achieved on a dynamic basis. So we actually monitor uh, each uh, location. Uh, we have a number of cameras. Uh, we also have support staff that are out in the field. And those, uh, those are actually fed back in real time and uh, schedules are actually being updated overnight. Uh, if we find that there's a particular location where it does appear to either there's overcrowding or uh, there's extra services needed, they are actually deployed uh, and we have a rapid uh, a deployment in particular of buses that we can uh, move around the city at pretty short notice to address those issues. So it is very much a dynamic uh, marrying of uh, supply with demand. Well, I appreciate that, Mr. Sharp. Um, have we detected through those methods any particular issues that are affecting any of the major locations and uh, health workers? And have you had to use those contingencies that you just outlined? Uh, yes, uh, the, I wouldn't describe them as contingencies. Uh, this is actually a planned uh, sure. process to actually uh, match the demand uh, profile uh, with the supply that's needed. So effectively, there's a core schedule, and then we supplement that core schedule where we see the demand. As you can appreciate, uh, with the various uh, evolutions that have occurred through the public health orders, uh, particularly in this last uh, uh, Delta version of the virus, uh, the demand profile has also shifted. Uh, transport is, is uh, multimodal, uh, so there's buses uh, point yes, to point, but, but and, uh, that provides a number of opportunities. The supplemental services that you just made a reference to, where have you had to deploy those supplemental services? Uh, the supplemental services have, have been deployed uh, principally on uh, routes where there've either been uh, uplifts. So for example, uh, when the construction industry uh, was uh, allowed to come back and commence work, uh, obviously there was a tradie peak uh, that tradie peaks uh, very early in the morning and we were able to target those services and some of those are around the eastern suburbs some, some are from uh, other suburbs uh, the, the other area where we've been able to deploy these this capacity is where we have had large numbers of staff isolating uh, in our uh, franchise bus operations and uh, where those uh, operations have been impacted we've been able to supplement uh, some services there to have effectively a regular service that went down the main routes to continue to support the sure. uh, essential workers. If you can identify precisely where the supplemental resources have been used, that would be great. But now that you mention it, um, in respect to the 400 workers um, who are currently isolating and equally the people throughout this entire period have had to isolate, uh, has that led to services having to be cancelled? Unfortunately, there have been uh, services at points that have been cancelled and uh, we've been able to maintain a, a minimum schedule. Uh, so on occasion, so you will have noticed quite publicly that we've uh, uh, targeted particular schedules. So for example, a Sunday timetable, which we've then supplemented to meet the demand. Uh, some of those have been driven by uh, the isolation events. Do we know how many services have had to be cancelled and where precisely they were cancelled? And incidentally, what were uh, the services? We wouldn't. Uh, Rob Sharp, uh, we wouldn't have that information uh, here, but certainly can take that on notice. Okay, do you know how many people were impacted by the cancellation of services? Uh, I'd have to uh, pass to uh, Mr. Collins on the operational side to uh, to know whether he's got that data at hand. That would be helpful. And if Mr. Collins could also then answer whether or not transport has had to pay for taxis or for ride shares for essential workers to, and to be able to reach their destination, that would be helpful too. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, certainly in terms of uh, the uh, use of uh, taxis and ride share, uh, not specific detail. I think what we have been doing, we have some excellent monitoring data regarding loadings of trains, uh, buses, uh, we use our task force and our dynamic timetabling team to look at those schedules. We have uh, worked directly with health and education to ensure that those schools are still operating. We provide school bus services and schools have even called in to say, don't send any more buses. We haven't got pupils who need schools. Um, and we've been as dynamic as possible. It is obviously going to be where cases occur. 
and we do need to isolate the workforce. It's obvious that we do sometimes need to cancel services. The good news is that the complaints, which initially started uh, when we made those first changes of that two week lockdown period, they have reduced to a very, very low number now. And also the information about what services are available to our customers is ready available. Sorry, but Mr. Collins, my question that I think you were meant to answer was uh, what essential workers have had their journeys interrupted by the cancellations? Are you monitoring that, that or not? We absolutely. Um, we have a whole series of authorised uh, workers, marshals. Uh, we observe with the 12,000 CCTV cameras. We also. So can we just then have the information? I appreciate the fact that you collect the information, but can we now have the result of your collection? I can't give you the precise daily detail. We do record the, the level of services and certainly the levels of services which are over COVID capacity, which is at the moment about one and a half percent that is recorded de in detail. On notice, can we get the more detailed information? Uh, we're certainly trying to provide as much information as we have. As you recognise, there are still 300,000 people travelling and most of those oh. journeys are successfully made by essential workers. Can I just turn to another matter now, which is to do with the new Emerald class of ferries? And this is to you, Mr Secretary. Um, have the new Emerald class of ferries been tested to withstand waves up to seven metres that occur um, sometimes in harbour crossings? The, uh, thank you for the question. The uh, ferries are, uh, are tested uh, thoroughly and uh, Mr Howard uh, Collins can certainly talk to that. In regards to uh, wave height, the, uh, there's a number of standards that are in place and the operators uh, need to comply with yeah. those standards. And is a seven, the ability to withstand a seven metre swell one of them? And has it been tested? That's the question. I'd have to uh, defer to uh, Mr. Collins in regards to the specification uh, of the uh, ferry. Sure. Howard Collins, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, for, and for the question. Uh, regarding the uh, Emerald Class 2 ferries, those which uh, will be deployed on the Manly service, their operational ability is is actually identical, if not more, able to deal with uh, four to four and a half metre swells um, when waves get uh, significantly higher than that we do withdraw freshwater classes today uh, and would continue to understand and work closely with our maritime colleagues about weather conditions and the alternative bus services put on the actual ferry uh, the emerald twos have specifically designed bows uh, to ensure that the stability under those conditions oh, the question are was have can they withstand swells of seven but i'm in hearing from your implication that if, the, if you're maintaining your current policy of withdrawing ferries, then the answer is no, they can't. Is that fair? They, they, they are better equipped um, to but have they been operate tested? under, if, um, they are better equipped to operate under even greater conditions of swell than freshwater class. But there is obviously um, every um, Captain or, or master will make judgments calls not only on on uh, heights of uh, swell but God, other conditions. I do appreciate winds, that, and I'm not. Uh, but look, it's just a really simple question, really. Have they been tested to withstand swells of up to seven meters? I believe I cannot give you that information. I will uh, be able to get to it, but I understand the operational conditions are they are being tested in, have been tested in, of those identical from the freshwater class and that they have the ability to operate under the same conditions. Do you have the total cost so far of building, repurposing, testing, fixing, retesting and delivering the second generation Emerald class ferries to replace the existing ferries? Well, Collins, uh, no, I don't have this information. Obviously, this is not a cost to transport for New South Wales. These ferries uh, were procured uh, and uh, from Burden, an Australian company, uh, by Transdev as part of their ferries contract. Sure, but do we just, if you can take it on notice what the, what the cost is in that respect, that would be good. But do you have a, any information on what the cost of strengthening the second generation Emerald class to repurpose them for harbour crossings? Uh, and what were, are the actual extra fuel costs and emissions of adding five tonnes of hull reinforcement to the weight of these ferries? The, um, 
Howard Collins, the Emerald Class 2 ferries were designed by Australian architects and uh, at the start of that design, uh, the naval architects uh, made sure that the uh, hulls and structures were designed to withstand those types of conditions. It's part of that overall design um, and uh, therefore those weren't additional uh, costs in terms of their, their procurement. I don't have those costs at hand because they are through the commercial contract between Burden and Transit. Sure, but do you have an idea as to how much extra we'll be paying in fuel costs and how much extra emissions are likely to be emitted as a result of adding five tonnes of power reinforcement to the, to the ferries? Uh, to answer your question specifically, no, but they are much more efficient, very, very efficient compared with the freshwater class, which was commissioned in the 1980s uh, with uh, large diesel engines, they are more fuel efficient and certainly fuel conditions vary depending on weather, loadings and other things. And our Emerald class ferries are very fuel efficient compared with the class of ferry they're replacing. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Opposition time has expired. I will hand over to Mr. Banasiak. Thank you. Um, my initial questions I'll direct to Mr. Sharp, but feel free to um, defer them if you need to. Um, We've got quite a few questions here about the reinstatement of a ferry service um, and wharves at La Perouse and Kernel. Um, Mr. Sharp, why did the 4,500 page EIS ignore fish assemblages and spawning aggregations of species like cephalopods? And why did it ignore that this area is a important spawning ground for squid? Uh, Rob Sharp, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, Transport does take its uh, responsibilities very seriously when it comes to environmental studies and uh, for any project or change, uh, we go through a rigorous process. In regards to your uh, specific question, I'd have to defer to Mr. Collins and, uh, and see whether we need to take that on notice. Howard Collins, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, uh, in specific detail, I will have to take that on notice. Obviously, we're going through the the whole process of consultation, environmental impact in, in that area, uh, obviously in, in both locations and uh, fully understand the sensitivity of the site and the importance of the environmental conditions uh, there present. But I'll take that on notice, provide more information for you. Sure, thank you. It The proposal, um, particularly with the ferry sweep, um, it cuts out two significant proportions of a recreational fishing haven. I would just curious as to what adjustments or what conversations have you had with uh, Department of Fisheries about how that recreational fishing haven may need to be compensated or adjusted um, due to the loss of these two significant proportions of the recreational fishing haven? Howard Collins, uh, I don't know the details. I know extensive consultation and we certainly will, will take on notice your point. Um, regarding consultation, but we have certainly engaged with local council, fisheries, uh, the Aboriginal community, which are very keen to get involved in providing uh, services as well, and the sensitivity of that area. But uh, I would imagine we will be in full consultation with our colleagues from fisheries. We work with them, as you know, every day. Yeah, the, the, the fisher, New South Wales Fisheries comments on the project are quite interesting. They actually stated that they can't support the project in its current form. Have you, have you spoken to them and tried to tease out what specifically their concerns are and how, and how you're going to address, address them? It seems a, a big hurdle to get over when another government department can't support your project. Thank you very much. Howard Collins, again, um, I will find out more specific detail. Um, I haven't personally spoken to my opposite colleagues. This is all part of a consultation process, obviously working with DPI as well, understanding the impacts uh, with the National Park. Um, and we would certainly be taking seriously any comments and feedback made by those people we have consulted. Okay. Are you aware of the recent uh, objection to this project by Randwick City Council, where they've cited uh, negative environmental amenity impacts as well as a shortcoming in the business case? Um, are you aware of those? Uh, were you aware of that objection by the Randwick City Council? Thank you for your question, Howard Collins. 
Uh, not specifically, I'm certainly aware of uh, certainly Sutherland Council's feedback. Um, I, can, I will take on notice the information may have been provided to my maritime uh, and planning section regarding Randwick Council. Thank you. Okay. Would you, specifically on the business case, are you able to advise us on the annual subsidies that the department will have to provide for this ferry service? And what the proposed adult and concession fares will be on on this ferry service? Howard Collins, uh, I'm personally unable to provide that. I don't know whether my, any of my colleagues have. I think it probably is too early at this stage to understand uh, those financials once we've gone through obviously full consultation. But I don't know whether my colleague uh, Burke O'Neill may have some information. But at this stage, I think. Uh, uh, it is too early to say what those numbers will be. Miss Miss O'Neill, do you have any further comments? Megan Mac O'Neill, no, we'll need to take that on notice. Uh, Mr. Collins, you say that you are still consulting, but the submissions have closed. And my understanding that there's a report that's going to be submitted to the planning minister for his decision. So, when you say consultation, who is that with? Uh, thank you for the question, Howard Collins. Again. Uh, yes, I understand consultation has closed, but this is uh, quite often, as we know, with many of these, an ongoing process. Um, we will, uh, in due course, provide the report, as you mentioned, uh, and there may be further questions and consultation and discussions uh, that we may have with various parties concerning uh, this actual proposal. Thank you. This You may defer this to Mr Carlon, but there have been concern, some concerns expressed to me about safety and reliability of this ferry service because the ferry service actually sweeps across a Port Botany commercial shipping channel. And so obviously, for obvious reasons, port activities would have to take precedence. So I'm just wondering as to what uh, considerations have been given for maritime safety, um, given that there's up to 36 crossings of the channel per day um, done by the port. Thank you for the question, Howard Collins. Um, yes, I understand that. I know the area pretty well, living uh, close by, uh, and it's probably very similar to uh, Sydney Harbour in many respects in terms of traffic. Uh, we are certainly aware of the need to ensure that maritime protocols are followed at all times and that the analysis of the routes, timings, and also the training of, of those people will be to the highest standard. I will pass to my colleague, Abdullah uh, Khan, to add any further information if he wants to. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Collins, and thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, look, um, of course, part of the process is to gather all of the safety information as part of the um, development of the um, safety plans for mitigating any risk. And so, um, clearly, um, I don't have that information right to hand at the moment, but we should be able to provide that information as part of the process on notice. Okay, and perhaps on notice, Mr. Carlin or, or Mr. Collins, can you provide the committee any any modelling or data that suggests, I guess, how the ferry service will have to run to a timeline or adjust its timeline if it gets caught between these port operations? So I imagine there would be a point of no return where a ferry service could ha would have to stop and, and wait for the commercial operations to finish and get out of the way before a ferry service could continue. So if you could give us, a, I guess, some modelling or some data about how that process is going to be managed and how that ferry service will keep to a timeline, um, given those those complications. Howard Collins, thanks for the question. Um, yes, obviously, uh, the details of what services will operate are yet to be defined, whether that's, um, you know, a service which might be um, not as busy as perhaps the Manly Corridor in view of the numbers and the, the, the areas and forecasts involved. Uh, and we can certainly, when available, uh, provide some of the understanding of how we uh, deal with traffic similar in a way to uh, movements across uh, other harbours. But uh, we don't expect that this particular route will be uh, extremely busy. Um, the great thing about it is that it will provide an opportunity for us to engage with our Aboriginal colleagues, both at La Perouse, uh, and uh, we have had discussions already 
to ensure this it becomes uh, something to engage with uh, the history of our first people, which is a very critical and important site on both sides of this corridor. Sure, and just just going back to the question I asked about the annual subsidies. So, in your answer, you said you're still working that out. Do we have a, I guess, a projected cost at all? I know there's some figures around 17 million being spent to build it, but then there's there was a seventy thousand dollar feasibility study. Um, you obviously got these annual subsidies, and there's been commentary by the Attorney General Mark Speakman, who's I think the member for the area or close to the member for the area, where he said that there'll be whole of life asset maintenance costs on top of this as well. So do we do we have a projected uh, figure in terms of how much this is going to cost us? Um, overall. Thank you for your question, Howard Collins. Um, I don't have those figures to hand. Uh, what information we have publicly or available to, to this group, we will provide. I think it does depend uh, on the commercial and the uh, understanding of how this operate will root, well, how the cost and the operation of the route will, will contain. Um, we are not at that stage yet. And there may well be a lot of variables in terms of overall cost and also the subsidy, if any, which need to be provided. Once those are available, obviously, they can be shared with uh, those who require it. Okay, thank you. Whatever, yeah, whatever, uh, I guess, costings you can provide us would be great. And if if available, I guess, a, a projected time frame in terms of when this project will pay uh, for itself given that you said that there's some commercial uh, operations involved or some commerciality of it as well. Um, we'd yeah. be interested to know as to how long this will take to pay off. Um, we'll and that. I believe my time's expired. Just to answer that final question, if I can, um, obviously we will have to deal with some of the commercial and confidentiality of any contract arrangements, but what we can provide, uh, we will in due course provide. It may not be available now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I just I might just pick up on some of those um, questions as well. So perhaps these are directed to you, Mr. Collins. Um, the wharf at La Perouse, in my my understanding, is it will replace a wharf that uh, was destroyed in the 1960s. Um, but the footprint of this new wharf will be at least seven to ten times the original size. Um, why is that? Um, the case and why is the wharf so much larger than those with similar purposes, such as um, Pitwater and Bundina? Howard College, thank you for your question. Uh, I understand that um, obviously this route was uh, many, many years ago, was damaged by a storm and then finally demolished. Um, the issue we have, I think, certainly on the south side is that uh, to ensure that we can gain adequate and uh, full access for for ferry services uh, we do need to ensure the wharf is long enough to deal with the fact that uh, it is uh, quite shallow in some of those areas um, obviously wharf lengths vary depending on the access and the depth of the water and also the vessel that uh, we use so that the designs have been worked through obviously with our maritime colleagues and those experts um, and probably that is the reason why it is uh, larger or longer uh, but the design obviously takes into account unlike previous uh, ferries to ensure that, that we minimize the impact on the environment ensuring we actually support and encourage uh, the uh, sort of wildlife and fish and, and other aspects of uh, the marine life in that area so when um, so I understand that the the wharf head is forty meters long, um, which is quite a lot. Um, it's quite long in terms of holding ferries that that you know, sorry taking ferries that only hold five hundred and twenty two passengers. Are you saying that's because um, of the way in which the the wharf will be used? As in, sorry, let me let me reframe that question. Um, are you saying that although it's only intended to take those small ferries, um, the all of the wharf is not going to be taken up with the ferries. It's about minimising the impact on the environment. Is that is that what you're saying? It really, it's the operational, Howard Collins again, apologise. 
Uh, it is the operational issue of depth of water, tidal movement. Uh, if people know, certainly in the South area, if you look at the oil uh, or fuel terminal uh, jetty, which uh, is right next to, well, further to the west in Cornell, it has a long promontory along a wharf because of the depth of the vessels uh, accessing at that particular point. Uh, that area, as I think some of your colleagues would know, um, uh, is uh, relatively shallow and therefore one of the reasons why the wharf length uh, is there is to ensure that uh, we can gain access uh, to uh, the operation at all times, whether that's a low tide or under certain conditions. Okay, understood. And what is the width of the wharf? I'd uh, be wrong of me to Howard Collins again to give you those details. I don't have them to hand, but we can certainly take that on notice. I think it's available through the consultation document. That would be very useful. Um, will the wharf um, be able to be used by cruise ship operators if a cruise ship terminal is built at um, Molino Point in Yarra Bay? I will have to take that on notice, uh, Howard Collins again. I don't. The purpose of this wharf is to support the ferry services between La Perouse and Cornell, um, and uh, really that's its main purpose. I don't have the details, but certainly it is not an intention to become a area where uh, many uh, ships or vessels would use on a regular basis. Um. Why was there no mention of this project in the New South Wales long-term transport 20-year master plan from December 2012 or in the Sydney Ferries future 20-year um, plan of May 2013? Well, Collins, I can't answer that particular question, but I know that uh, more recently uh, this uh, opportunity and uh, has come about, um, we can take on notice uh, what planning and information and the source of how this became uh, a subject uh, now for consultation and discussion. Uh, but it has been something uh, which has been talked about for decades, I believe. Locals tell me that for decades about the opportunity. Uh, would, uh, I know that both La Perouse and, uh, and Cornell and the people uh, involved are very keen to understand what this means for them, but also the uh, engagement and the improvements of working with the National Park and the Indigenous and Aboriginal populations. Um, thank you. In 2018, um, the current Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, co-launched a $50 million plan um, with the New South Wales Government to transform Kame Botany Bay National Park to include ferry wharves at Cornell and La Perouse, um, and also to an erect an aquatic monument, um, whatever that is, to, um, to James Cook. Um, as you know, and as you've, as you've alluded to, um, at La Perouse, our Aboriginal people have held a continuous connection to that land from the onset of colonisation to present. Um, in 1883, La Perouse became a settlement for Aboriginal peoples who were forcibly displaced from their lands by the New South Wales Aborigines Protection Board. Um, in your consultation with Aboriginal communities, do they think it's appropriate um, that the ferry uh, project at La Perouse uh, is in connection with a proposal to honour James Cook? Howard Collins, um, I can't answer that question because um, I can tell you though, what I will say is that we have worked very closely with the Aboriginal community of La Perouse. In fact, I have had uh, several meetings along with the Secretary of DPI, Jim Betts, uh, to engage with the community and understand the opportunities for employment, for ensuring that we uh, recognize, celebrate and understand those Aboriginal peoples on both of the uh, sides of this particular uh, access area. And it is very much uh, our view in transport that we will continue to support uh, the endeavors and the uh, energies and enthusiasm that this group and uh, equivalent groups have had to ensure that we recognize it. I can't comment on the particular 
uh, proposal or monument regarding the member for Cook. And I, I do appreciate that it's not your proposal, that it's Scott Morrison's proposal. Um, but in your negotiations with the Aboriginal community, has it been made explicit that this proposed ferry wharf is in connection with this proposed monument? Howard Collins, all of my discussions and those with Mr. Reid and, and Mr. Jim Leds, uh, we have not, I have not discussed that. We have focused on uh, ensuring that whatever services and uh, impacts we have on those communities that we uh, engage fully with the Aboriginal communities and ensure that we work with them in a constructive and positive way. And from your experience working with those people, would you agree that it would be inappropriate to build such a monument and such an important area for First Nations peoples? Howard Collins, I don't think it's appropriate for me to comment on that. I understand. Thank you. Um, I think I have, hang on, let me just check how many minutes. One minute left. Um, so I'll ask you a very quick um, question about, hang on, I'm going to get there. No, I haven't found my question in time. No, I'm a, apologies. I'm going to hand straight over to the opposition. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Chair. Uh, John Graham with a question perhaps to Mr. Carlin. Um, I wanted to ask about the government's mobile speed camera program. Last financial year, revenue from the program was up from $2.3 million to $23.7 million as a result of changes to the program. We've talked about those before at estimate. Uh, hours of enforcement are set to triple, or have set, have tripled commencing 1 July this year. I wanted you first just to confirm that the government's issued two contracts uh, for these services now, one to Redflex for $91.1 million for three years, and one to AccuCensus for $77 million for three years. Is that correct? I think you're on mute, Mr. Carlin. I'll be contributing to the fund for the um, very good Christmas gifts. But anyway, here we go. Uh, Bernard Carlon, uh, thank you for the question. So yes, that information is actually active. It's been released under the government information public access requirements um, for contracts that are entered into for those programs. Yes. Great. Thank you. And those contracts appear to be regionally based. Can you tell us which areas those respective contracts cover? Uh, so the contracts cover both the, well, the whole of New South Wales, essentially. So the two contracts cover the north and then the south. Um, and which company has the north and which company has the south? Sorry, my recollection of this. So I'll have to just so I can be able to provide you that information during the hearing. But um, I'll just have a look for that information and get back to you. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Looking at the publicly available figures uh, for these offences, why have fines for these cameras dropped in July from record highs in a range of locations to zero? And I might give you some examples. In Wagga, for example, in April, there were 584 offences. Wagga's often been in the top 10 locations. In Queanbeyan, they've dropped from 290 in April to zero. In the electorate of Bega, from 115 in April to zero. Uh, Nowra, 313 in May to zero in July. And along the Princess Highway, there were 901 offences in June. In July, there's now zero. What is going on in these locations? Yes, so uh, Bernard Carlin, uh, just to clarify, the mobile speed camera program, just uh, to clarify the uh, opening statement that um, that you've made, Mr. Graham. Uh, uh, publicly, it's been announced that the um, 21,000 hours will be introduced gradually, um, uh, and that that would be um, up until the end of this year. Uh, so the statement with regard to the 21,000 hours in July is um, not not accurate. Um, so we are rolling out the program across New South Wales. The program is in, includes a method which is about uh, anywhere any time detection of speeding right across the network. 
what we know is that 91% of people admit that they do speed. Uh, and we know that, um, you know, around 50% of those people are sometimes speeding and um, more than 20% of those people admit to um, speeding all the time and regularly. The, the mode of operation for mobile speed camera programs um, in terms of best practice um, is that you have uh, a, a system of uh, rotating enforcement right across the whole of the network. The network is 200,000 kilometres of road network. I might uh, bring so you back to the could... question, Mr. Carlin, yeah. because despite you saying this is anywhere, anytime, uh, that's not what the public figures show. In fact, in places in Sydney like Riverwood, uh, while they were having record fines in April, 171, that's now zero. In Norwest, in Sydney, it's dropped from 577 in April to zero. Uh, in some parts of the state, significant parts of the state, uh, there are no fines being issued. What is going on? So this is the normal um, process of rotating enforcement across the whole of the network. And so there will be times where enforcement will um, rotate from one location right across the state to another location. Um, so this is about having anywhere, anytime detection. Um, as we start to ramp up the hours um, and get to the 21,000 hours by the end of the year, uh, the random allocation across the network of enforcement is part of the best practice element of having uh, a speed camera program, a speed camera program that deters people from speeding right across the whole of the network, not at specific locations. Um, and that's all I might, I might put to you then the um, uh, information about the top 100 locations in July for these speed cameras. This is not random, uh, as you're suggesting. They are almost exclusively in the north of Sydney or in the north of the state. There are almost none. There's practically zero in the south of Sydney or the south of the state in one of these two contract areas. This isn't random. Yeah. What is going on? Yeah, so to clarify, there's, um, as we start to build up the contract areas and we get to 21,000 hours um, by, by the end of the year, um, the coverage of both regions will be uh, at the um, prescribed level for the contracts in terms of the delivery of 21,000 hours on average per month across New South Wales. Uh, and we're increasing um, yeah, at a rate which is will get us to that level. Uh, the distribution and the enforcement is uh, at the moment um, scheduled to be around 70% in the out of metropolitan areas across the state. Uh, and but Mr. Cullen, do you agree it's zero for about half the state at the moment? Do you agree at the moment? You, you hope to increase it, but it has crashed from record highs to zero across about half the state in the southern region you've described. Uh, Bernard Carlon, I uh, wouldn't say that's an accurate description. Have a look at the, the distribution of enforcement over the um, five month, six month period. Uh, the distribution of enforcement is across the whole of the contract areas. You're avoiding the issue, Mr. Carl. I'm not asking about the last five months. I'm asking about the change from April, May, June to when these 21,000 hours started and enforcement across half the state is now zero. There is no mobile speed camera enforcement in the publicly available figures. Those top 100 locations are all now in the north of the state. Do you accept, do you agree that that is the case? Uh, look, I don't have that specific information in front of me. I'll be able to take that question on notice and um, provide further information. This appears to be a catastrophic failure of the administration of this scheme um, where there is no mobile speed camera enforcement in the south of the state. Are you aware of that or not? Uh, well, I'd say that's not the case that there's no mobile speed um, camera enforcement in the whole of the south of the state. That's, uh, How many again, fines have been uh, issued again, in the southern contract area since the 1st of July? Yeah, again, uh, as I said, I'll take that uh, question on notice and provide further information. Uh, can you tell us, um, uh, you can't tell us which of these two 
uh, companies it is. Uh, some of these companies have been controversial. Redflex, for instance, had a high profile corruption uh, legal action against them in 2016 in the US. Um, is that the sort of thing that should be assessed during the uh, tender process? Uh, yes, if I could just correct the record, Bernard Carlon, um, it's been that that particular um, accusation around um, what happened in the US. Uh, there was a um, independent inquiry associated with the contract in in New South Wales and the operation of Revlex in Australia, and it was a totally um, need to be totally disconnected from that um, US event. So. Um, and that is on the public record, and so that's Understood. not the case. Thank um, you. Yep. So how, uh, in that southern area, how many cars, how many mobile speed camera cars are being operated? Do you have that detail? I uh, don't have that detail to hand, but I can provide that information on notice. Uh, and, and can you tell us how many cameras are actually operating in that southern area, let's say, where no fines appear to be issued? Yeah, so uh, I can provide the information on notice uh, and uh, noting that the number of cars is not the contract um, requirement. The contract requirement is for the delivery of uh, a number of hours of enforcement. Would you tell us how many cars, how many cameras, how many hours that would be helpful in this southern yes. contract region as you explain why this has um, collapsed to zero? The um, the decision was made to split this contract in two. Um, when was that an issue to two different companies? When was that decision made? Uh, so there was a um, open tender process, uh, which put the the contract into market. Uh, uh, recollection, but I can confirm, was in um, December and closed in late February. Um, but I can um, provide that information on notice. Uh, and a competitive tender process was run throughout New South Wales, and these were the two successful contractors. And how many companies tendered? Again, I can provide that information on notice. Uh, the tender details say Transport for New South Wales has decided to return to the market for MSC services to ensure best value and explore a multi vendor approach. Who made the decision to finally adopt that multi vendor approach? Uh, my uh, Bernard Carlin, my understanding is that every um, occasion where we've gone to the market, we've actually, um, for speed camera operations in New South Wales, that we've actually um, put it out for a um, open tender for multi-vendor approaches. Um, and so um, that's the way in which the tender operations have been conducted, as I recollect, um, in every instance. Um the contract, the tender itself uh, requires the company to demonstrate this. Uh, I quote, a demonstrated ability to satisfy the statement of requirements as well as to perform the services. Given that these services are not being provided by one of these companies, how did they get this contract? Uh, Bernard Carlon. Uh, so I just reiterate that um, the rollout of a contract is happening um, currently, and we'll reach the 21,000 uh, hours uh, by the end of the year, as previously announced, uh, and the contract companies um, uh, will be meeting those requirements under the contract. So how many hours are being delivered in Wagga or Queanbeyan or the south of the state at the moment? Can you tell us that? Again, I can take that. I don't have any information in front of me. And uh, as I said before, I'll take that on notice. All right. For this company, you were supposed to demonstrate it could perform the services before it was issued the contract. It's also required to uh, supply quite resource capability and availability, including the quality of transition. How did you test these things as the contracts were issued? Uh, again, I'll take that, in, that on notice, noting that in, uh, in general, that as I've said, there's a rollout of the program building up until um, the end of this year to 21,000 hours, and both contractors are on a path to meet that requirement um, by the end of the year. 
Mr. Cullen, they're not on track at the moment. It's at zero. Uh, those top 100 locations, none of them are in the in one of these two contract areas. Uh, what assurance can you give us that this will actually be on track? Do you have concerns, or are you comfortable that this is what was supposed to happen? Uh, again, I don't think I've um, said that I'd take that out on notice in terms of the details of the rollout of the contract and um, provide that information. Uh, is one of the milestones for this contract actually uh, finding anyone for speeding in July 2021? Is that a requirement of the contract? So uh, the specific requirements of a contract uh, to provide up to 21,000 hours of enforcement um, across the network in New South Wales. Um, as I said, I can provide on notice the information that you've requested. Mm. And you can't tell us at this point which of those two companies operates the southern region. That's uh, so fine. Just my recollection is that it is AccuCensus. Right. Um, are you aware that uh, AccuCensus employed from I understand March 2020 former Deputy Premier Troy Grant? Uh, his role was reported as being this. I quote: the facilitation of relationships and client introductions, particularly in relation to road safety and policing agencies. Uh, no, I'm, I'm Bernard Cullen. No, I'm not aware of that. Uh, and um, uh, I might come to you then at uh, this point then, Mr Sharp. Uh, since March 2020, have you any of your officials met with, talked to or received representations from former Deputy Prem Premier Roy Grant in relation to his role with AccuCensus? I'm personally not aware of, of that, uh, and I'd have to take it on notice uh, to Canvas management uh, and revert to you. If you could take it on notice, Mr Secretary, I'd appreciate it. I think you can understand the concern that um, this company seems to not be delivering the contract for whatever reason. They perhaps don't have the cars and the cameras. Uh, they do have uh, a former uh, Deputy Premier working for them. Uh, that seems to be their one asset here. If you could check that, uh, I would appreciate it on notice. Uh, were you aware, Mr Secretary, that there are no fines being issued across half the state uh, for speeding at the moment under your government, uh, under the agency's administration? Uh, Rob Sharp, uh, th thank you for that question. Uh, in respect to uh, individual contract performance, no, I'm not. Uh, aware of that. In in respect to the uh, actual details, um, the uh, information has been taken on notice to provide to you. What I would say is that uh, we do, as a general comment, with our procurement processes, have uh, detailed performance indicators that are in the contracts, uh, and there are specific review periods typically nominated in those contracts. Uh, Mr Sharp, I'm looking at the top 100 fines here, the locations across New South Wales, they're all in the north of the state. Uh, Carlingford, Foster, Blacksmiths, Northmead, Port Macquarie, Musselbrook, Forestville, Lane Cove, Yamba, 100 different locations, all of them in the north of the state, none of them in the south. Um, do you believe this is acceptable? Uh, as I indicated, uh, we'll need to get back to you in respect to the actual data that underpins uh, your question and we'll respond uh, to that. Uh, I don't have the uh, facts with me to be able to comment on that specifically. Why haven't you been told this is a catastrophic failure of a high profile road safety scheme uh, and you appear unaware of this altogether? If there are uh, issues uh, relating to a contract, uh, the processes would be to escalate those up uh, through the executive chain. Uh, I'm not aware of that particular issue that you're highlighting, and uh, the data will come through to you with uh, commentary on that as, as uh, previously advised. If this program did catastrophically fail in the way I'm suggesting, and I'm, I'm happy to provide this list of fines to you, would you expect to have known? Sorry, I'm not understanding the question. Would I expect Would you to expect know? to have been briefed uh, if a catastrophic failure of administration like this uh, had occurred? 
Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, this comes to the uh, protocols around uh, issues that arise within a large organisation. Uh, there's typically escalation paths on uh, contracts, and if they're uh, contracts that do impact on uh, our ability to deliver essential services or the safety of the public, then yes, they would. Uh, the the expectation would be that that would be escalated to myself. Yeah. Uh, and that hasn't happened. Uh, do you think it's appropriate that drivers are recording record fines in the north have gone up again in July? Meanwhile, in the south of the state, pretty much anything goes. Uh, we appear not to be uh, regulating speeding at all with these mobile speed cameras. Will you investigate this issue? Uh, as indicated, we've taken on notice to actually secure the data that you've requested uh, and uh, provide the commentary back to you on that. The data is publicly it's... available. I'm asking, will you investigate, Mr Secretary, what is going on here? Yes, uh, we've uh, indicated to you that uh, we will explore that data. The question you've raised is in regards to the contract and the mix of fines. Uh, from a uh, public uh, perspective, the uh, agenda for us is very much to have fines. So in the north, talk about record fines. Uh, we are looking at changing the behaviour of drivers, uh, unsafe behaviours, and uh, this is very much part of the rollout. Uh, in respect to your question to the southern side, uh, I have taken that on notice and uh, and will revert to you accordingly. Yeah, and doesn't that beg the question, doesn't the same principle apply in the south of the state, in Wagga and Queanbeyan, in the south of Sydney? This is not anywhere, anytime. This is exclusively now in half the state. And uh, I've taken the uh, question on notice and we will revert specifically to you on, on that request, Chair. Thank you. I might hand back to you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Benassiak. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just go back to uh, some more questions on, on that proposed ferry service, Mr. Collins. Um, picking up from the chair's questions um, about the length of the wharf, you you mentioned obviously it's to accommodate certain vessels, but you didn't actually go into detail as to what proposed uh, ferries will be used um, for this service. Do you, do you have uh, any indication as, as to what uh, ferries will be used, what size and, and, and class? Thank you for the question, Howard Collins. Um, I haven't got any details of the types or classes of ferries uh, in these early days. I think the the area uh, we mentioned, and, and I think you understand, uh, would not be uh, for large uh, vessels uh, similar to you know a, a freshwater class, because the conditions uh, and the access and the numbers of people involved. Um, we very much see that this could be a similar sort of operation to to our friends uh, the Tribal Warrior, obviously working with the uh, La Perouse, uh, Alliance. Uh, uh, we understand that they have a number of proposals, but it's early days. We're, we're certainly looking for a vessel which is uh, suitable for the environment, uh, can deal with those conditions uh, across, obviously, the entrance to um, Port Botany uh, area and understanding what that means, but it is early to to say which type of class of vessel will be operating. Well, are there any vessels that you can rule out based on the the four thousand five hundred <laughs> page EIS um, I, directly? Thank you for the question again, Howard Collins. Um, I personally aren't able to provide that information. Um, I think um, we obviously would consider that on a case by case basis, uh, but uh, I think our experience in operation of other locations of a similar nature mean that um, there will be certain vessels which won't be suitable and others which will be ideally operated. But that will come through obviously further consultation discussion and uh, will be obviously released as part of our proposals. In Questions from the chair, you, you spoke about uh, the purpose of, of this ferry service. Um, I've just got a few questions around, around that because the purpose seems to be multiple, but it's also unclear. Um, so recognising that there is obviously a purpose there to connect with the Aboriginal communities. Um, it was raised in the consultation that 
a perhaps a more cost effective uh, way of doing this would be a bus service. Um, however, that was quickly dismissed, saying that it, it takes nearly two hours by bus to take that route. But a quick Google search will tell you, it can, you know, in peak time, it'll take 45 minutes. So I'm just wondering where that two, two hour figure was plucked from um, in the EIS. Thank you for the question, Howard Collins. I can't give you specific details. Having uh, driven probably from Cornell on various occasions and uh, from other locations, I can tell you pre COVID times, sometimes it took me an hour just to get out of, uh, get through uh, uh, Cronulla, let alone uh, get to La Peru. So, uh, and we also know it's a very circuitous route. Uh, and the, the operation, obviously, uh, of a ferry service is not just about time savings or uh, this does open up the opportunities uh, for National Park, for example, which is a fantastic uh, walk, unfortunately, only available to us within the LGA at the moment. But I would say the opportunities of both Laparoos and, uh, and Cornell and National Park, this is what this ferry is about. It's not just about providing uh, a door-to-door -door service for people to get from one side of the of, uh, of Sydney to the other. If 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 that's the case, Mr. Collins, then why does the 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 business case, which I think is Appendix K, talk about that forty percent of it's going to be commuter traffic, um, which is non-visitor, and only six percent uh, will come from new visitors. So you 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 pick up there that and, and say that you know this will be a big, I guess, a significant boost in terms of new visitors through the national park. But that doesn't seem to resonate with the figures that are included in the business case. Well, thank you for the question, Howard Collins. Again, yeah, forty percent less than half of the of people will be using that service may be commuters uh, rather than others. You know, the other sixty percent we believe will be a mixture of new people arriving, um, but also uh, people who wish to sort of extend their their exercise and, and experience uh, from one side of. Uh, of uh, the bot port botany to the other. Um, so certainly as far as we're concerned, it has a multiple opportunity here. Um, a bit like the, the Bundina Ferry does and has been doing since 1939. Um, it's provided a sort of uh, a service for those regular commuters, but also those people who want to explore another great uh, Royal National Park. Um, but it is early days. What we're very interested in is is talking to the community and businesses and understanding what can be provided and the opportunities there for opening up uh, this area on both sides of the land. Where have, where have those figures been drawn from, um, Mr. Collins, in terms of the, the, I guess, the breakdown of visitors? Thank you for your question, Howard Collins. I haven't got the details. I'd imagine they were provided by our own customer strategy uh, and technology team or have done some survey work to understand, but we can certainly through that consultation document and the information provided to public, uh, we can share the source of that uh, uh, assessment of uh, 40 to uh, percent uh, who will be uh, commuters. Yeah, on notice, could you provide that to the committee in, so, in some detail in terms of where those projections have come from? Our colleagues again, uh, yeah, we, we, I will have a look and see if we can uh, provide that information to you. I certainly think it's been provided as part of the assessment. Okay. Um, can you tell us in detail, what is the actual proposed width of the wharf? It's like the length is mentioned once in, in that EIS, which, which is at 180 metres, but there's no mention of the actual width. Of, of the wharf. I know it mentions the wharf head being 10 metres wide, but not the wharf itself. Do we, ha do, do we have those figures? Thank you for the question, Howard Collins. I think I did answer this uh, to the chair, but uh, I don't have that information to hand. Uh, I'm not sure whether that detailed information is available yet, but if it is available in terms of average or understanding of what the wharf, wharf width will be, uh, we can certainly provide that on notice. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it have been critical to the EIS to have, you know, the full foot footprint, you know, in in understanding the environmental impact? I'm a little, a little bit puzzled that you 
it would include the length, but uh, have no indication of what the width would be. It just seems a bit nonsensical to me. Thank, thank you, question. It may well be available. It may not be to the nearest millimeter, but it may well be available. We take that on notice. Uh, but obviously, um, there are a lot of considerations in detailed design. But if it is available, I will make sure that it's, it's provided to this committee. No problems. Um, just digging a bit deeper in terms of the purpose, there was a, uh, in November last year, there was a future transport 2056 Southeast Sydney transport strategy, which seems to make La Perouse into a bit of an intermodal transport hub uh, where that ferry connects. So it proposed a four stop ultra fast metro service to CBD, a metro airport linked via Randwick, three rapid bus services providing the same service. Um, all those, all those sort of, uh, I guess, projects um, seem to sort of connect and interconnect um, with the potential for a cruise terminal in Yarra Bay. Now, are, are these are these projects interconnected or interdependent of each other, um, including the potential or the proposed cruise terminal in Yarra Bay? Um, Howard Collins again. Again, um, my mic, mic is not on mute. Um, thank you for the question. I, I may refer to the twenty fifth, the sixth strategy to Mr. Sharp, but let me just give a general comment on that. Obviously, uh, the proposals for the southeast area. Uh, is a long term plan. Um, there were long term plans in the 20s for this area as well, uh, people remember. But um, I, I certainly, as far as the, the impact and the proposal regarding the ferry cruise ferry terminal, um, I haven't got any further information. But maybe Mr. Sharp would like to comment generally about the 2056 strategy and, and the intent of this regarding uh, that particular area. Uh, Rob Sharp, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the 2056 uh, vision statement is actually looking at the southeast. Uh, there is there is a uh, recognition uh, that there's a lot of growth there. There's a lot of uh, uh, travel, and over time, uh, transport solutions will be required. Uh, the metro uh, uh, agenda is currently focused to the west, and. Uh, the connectivity across multiple modes is a key element of the planning that we do. Uh, the actual detailed plans come through separately to the vision. So the vision is that long-term stake in the ground, uh, the aspiration around where modes might travel and how they might connect. The actual detailed planning will come through as uh, it is prioritised by government and, uh, and funding uh, becomes available to, uh, to deliver. The uh, combination of of uh, of different modes does make sense around key uh, areas of population, or where there's a significant uh, transfer opportunities between modes of transport. As a as a general comment, that's the driver behind the vision. Okay, thank you. I might press further when I get another go, Miss Boyd. Thank you very much, Mr. Benasiak. Um, I found my uh, final set of ferry questions, um, Mr. Collins. I will uh, direct to you, and then I'll move on to um, to a, a separate issue. I just wanted an update on where the Glebe ferry was at. I understand there was the the trial um, that ended in 2020, uh, and there was very strong sorry in April 2020, and there was very strong community support for that Glebe ferry service. Um, understandably, COVID. Uh, may have got in the way, but what is the current plan uh, for that service? Thank you for your question, Howard Collins. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right that obviously uh, proposals for changing and enhancing the ferry services um, have been obviously uh, under review and put on hold in many respects because of the, it has been the hardest hit under the COVID numbers, uh, less than 5% of people using the ferries um, at the height of the pandemic, and those numbers are, are still not increasing. But we do certainly have a plan going forward to examine a lot of options, uh, enhancing the existing service, of looking at other destinations for ferries, because we recognise that Sydney Harbour is a fantastic opportunity 
for people to travel, not only for, for commuting purposes, but also for leisure purposes. Uh, and we see that part of the strategy. I don't know whether my colleague, uh, Meg Burke O'Neill, may wants to comment generally on the uh, uh, ferry strategy uh, for Greater Sydney, for example, but certainly uh, that was an area we we're very interested in and will be in the future. So I'll pass Thank to my you, colleague Ms. if that's okay. Thank you. Um, and um, Ms. Burke O'Neill, if we could focus particularly on the ferry, on the Glebe ferry, um, and what's going to happen with that, that would be very useful. Thank you for your question, um, Megan Burke O'Neill. Um, I don't have any details on the Glebe ferry service. I will take on notice to come back to you with some more on that. Thank you, that would be very useful. Um, can we talk about WestConnex? Um, I'm not sure who to direct that to, so I'll start with you, Mr. Collins, and you could direct to someone else if um, appropriate. Um, as I'm sure you are aware, a Roselle homeowner and his son um, were reported in the news as having been sent two pairs of noise cancelling headphones um, and a respite deed uh, after complaining to West Connect's contractor, John Holland, uh, about the unbearable noise caused by the boring machines underneath their home. How many residents have been asked to sign such deeds that limit their ability to pursue further compensation uh, from the project or from talking to the media? Howard Collins, thank you for the question. I would like to ask my colleague Camilla Drover uh, to specifically answer the question as uh, she is uh, responsible for infrastructure and projects. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Drover. Camilla Drover, thank you, Howard. Um, the the Rosalind Exchange um, has been delivered by its contractor, obviously, and they are responsible for complying with the conditions of approval for the project. And a part of that, of course, is ensuring that noise is mitigated and addressed on the way through. Um, as part of the conditions of approval, um, there are a number of mitigation measures that are offered to the community to address the noise issues. They do include uh, the noise cancelling headphones. There's a range of other measures that are um, part of uh, the offering as well. Um, uh, accommodation away from home is also offered if necessary. Um, so there's a whole suite of measures that are offered. Um, there have been a number of sets of those noise cancelling headphones that have been handed out to the contractor, to the community. Um, and we are, of course, aware of that media. And in fact, that media did generate uh, more awareness that those headsets were available. And we've actually had an uptake in the community of those noise cancelling headsets. It's obviously um, more challenging at the moment when people are working from home and at home, given COVID-19. Uh, and they're therefore more aware of the noise impacts of the construction projects. Uh, so the contractor is taking special measures um, and greater awareness in the community of what can be done to mitigate, mitigate those impacts. Thank you. And I'm sure that's um, certainly better than nothing um, to receive those, those um, noise cancelling headphones. Um, but I'm particularly interested in why the contractor was using um, deeds and requiring people to sign, requiring residents to sign deeds um, to say that they wouldn't seek any compensation and that they wouldn't um, talk to the media about it. Um, were you concerned by the report in relation to those deeds? Were you aware? Uh, we obviously did see that report in the media. I don't have any particular information, but I can take on notice and see what we can provide. Um, but uh, the contractor needs to meet its obligations. Um, uh, that there was no um, uh, involvement of transport in with those deeds. But as I said, we can take on notice to to come back to you about those well, deeds. Thank you. If you could take on notice, how many um, of those residents have been asked to sign those deeds? Um, but also, if you could take on notice, what the department's response has been in relation to. Um, that report and whether or not you have contacted um, John Holland with any concerns. That would be very useful. Yes, happy to take it on. Thank you. Um, can you tell me how many properties have been damaged by West Connect so far? Uh, a bit of context, any damage that does arise out of uh, the West Connect project is the responsibility of the contractor uh, and West Connect. Um, there have been a number of cases of uh, claim damage from property owners. Um, those matters are in the first instance dealt between uh, the property owner and the contractor. 
If they're not satisfied with the outcome of that process, they can escalate it to ResConnex. Um, and then we also now have the Independent Property uh, Impact Assessment Panel, EPF. So that's an independent panel. It's independent of Transport, ResConnex and the contractors. Um, it's got a three-person panel, uh, structural expertise and geotechnical, geotechnical expertise. Um, so property owners that believe they have been uh, subject to damage, they can make their case to that panel. They assess um, the cases and they determine uh, uh, on behalf of the, the property owners. And so as part of, but sorry, as part of the contractual arrangement that you have with the contractor, is there nothing in the contract in relation to um, standards of behaviour for the contractor? Um, any sort of KPIs in relation to damage, for instance? Yes, absolutely. I mean, obviously they need to comply with the conditions of approval. Um, and part of those is very extensive monitoring, um, both pre-construction, uh, during construction, and both at the surface and also at the low ground. The other thing that the contract is required to do for every property that is within 50 metres of the tunnel alignment, they need to do a pre-construction survey. So that's at no cost to the property owner. And that's offered to, to everyone within that um, within those parameters, 50 metres from the tunnel. That uh, establishes the condition of the property before construction commences. And then that survey is done after construction is completed. And therefore, you can assess whether any damage has occurred on the way through. Um, but over and above that, of course, there is very, very extensive monitoring um, uh, of the works as they proceed. And as part of that, um, contractual obligation then or a set of contractual KPIs and the fact that this is being monitored, presumably then there is a, a significant amount of information coming back to the department about the amount of damage and how much compensation is being claimed. Is that correct? Yes, there's a very significant amount of uh, information, monitoring information that is recorded, um, also rainfall data and other um, environmental data is also collected because obviously with, with clay soils that they shrink and uh, expand with, with weather conditions, et cetera. So all that information is collected. If the matter is escalated to that EPAP panel, that information is provided to the EPAP panel. The EPAP panel also has the ability with the consent of the property owner to actually go out and, and do a site investigation. That's obviously a little bit more problematic of late with the COVID-19 restrictions. But that's the intent to have this independent panel that regardless of, of what the contractor is saying, WestConnex or ourselves can look at the facts, the data and make an independent determination for that property owner. Could you perhaps take on notice then um, how many properties have been damaged by WestConnex so far? How many residents have received compensation for damage to their homes? And thirdly, what the average value of compensation received is? Okay, I, I can say that 51 uh, matters have been escalated to the EPAP panel, and that's right across uh, the West Connex portfolio. Uh, I think there's only one item that's been escalated for the Rosal Interchange to date. There are just a handful for uh, the M4 M5 link. The majority are cases that arose out of the M4 East um, property matters. Um, and I believe just over half of those matters have been through the EPAP process and been determined. Um, but I can take on notice um, the, the other parts of your question. Thank you very much. We've got just, I think, one and a half minutes left. Did the opposition want to just grab that time with a quick question? I, I do. I do. Um, Go ahead, Mr. Mookie. Uh, actually, uh, Mr. Secretary, this is to you. Uh, are you going to be mandating vaccines to transport for New South Wales staff and other public transport workers? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we follow public health orders and uh, take advice from a uh, whole of government policy positions. And uh, at the moment, what we're doing is actually risk assessing all of our operations, uh, the type of activities, uh, the locations and uh, geographies, and also the mobility risks. As we transition out of uh, COVID, uh, particularly this uh, Delta variant, uh, we're actively working through where those risks are. So, Mr Sharp, as you would have heard the Chair say, my time is limited. And the question is, are you contemplating mandating vaccines for transport for New South Wales staff and other public transport workers? 
uh, that there is no policy to mandate. Uh, what we are doing is working through all the risks and risk assessments uh, to actually understand that. And we'll also be consulting with our staff and uh, unions in regards to any matters Thank that you. come out of that risk assessment. I appreciate that, Mr Sharp. I did ask some of these questions to the Department of Premier and Cabinet. And I'm aware that they are developing guidance as well. But uh, have you sought any legal advice as to whether or not you have uh, an obligation under workplace health and safety to check vaccination status and or mandate it? And equally, have you sought any legal advice as to whether or not you can restrict or otherwise take actions against employees if they refuse to get vaccinated? Uh, thank you. Uh, in regards to uh, the evidence from uh, the Premier's Cabinet, I can't comment on someone else's evidence. In regards to transport for New South Wales, uh, there's quite clear legislation in regards to uh, responsibilities uh, for uh, the safety of workers and uh, there is an obligation to take reasonable uh, activity and actions to ensure the safety of our workers. Uh, there's also uh, quite specific legal uh, obligations around the protection of data of our staff. Uh, so in regards to are our staff vaccinated, uh, that is a private matter for them and uh, we can't uh, collect that unless it's for a specific lawful reason under the public health orders. Just to conclude then, when will we have a policy for transport for New South Wales that you can tell the public and you can tell the travelling public as well as to what exactly is the vaccination policies that apply to the staff who are carrying them? The uh, uh, policy uh, is actually set out in uh, the public health orders and, and the uh, current uh, regulatory environment. Uh, what we are doing is uh, actually actioning our responsibilities, which are clearly articulated uh, around us taking uh, reasonable care and due care of our staff. And uh, we are working through that process. Uh, it, it is a challenging time for everyone because the uh, uh, COVID Delta strain in particular has been evolving. And there's been a number of public health orders, as you are aware. And so that uh, also factors into uh, how we take care of our staff. And there's been a number of immediate actions that we've put in place to also support the safety of our staff uh, whilst we're going through this transition period. Thank you. Um, our time for this um, part of the hearing is up. We will take a quick break. Be back at 11.15. Uh, just a reminder to turn your videos off if you don't want your um, lounge rooms and offices broadcast to the world. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Is everybody back? Just checking. We appear so. Excellent. Thank you. I will start with the opposition. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Secretary, just a few final questions about the ferries. Uh, given that your recent tests of the new ferries um, suggested that you're only testing capacity for 200 passengers and it's taking more than 15 minutes to unload them. Uh, it's the case, isn't it not, that we're just not going to have enough capacity to carry passengers when summer peaks. Is that right? Uh, Rob Sharp. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, in regards to the actual testing of the, the numbers, I'd have to pass to Mr Collins in regards to the actual test details and the numbers that you referred to. Thank you. Okay. I think that was for, thank you for the question, um, Howard Collins. Um, Mr. Mookie, are you referring to the uh, which class of ferry and which two hundred? Just to clarify, the Emerald the class. The, the Emerald, Emerald class. class. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, the the great advantage of uh, the proposal is that we know we're using the Emerald class every day. Uh, now uh, we've got another three arriving very very soon is that the frequency of service uh, that we intend to provide for the Manly F1 service will be every 20 minutes. Um, we are proposing to have a, uh, a mixture of obviously the fresh waters at this stage, uh, particularly at weekends, 
uh, but the high frequency will allow us to move more people. Um, we have carried out, I believe, a test for 200. Um, those tests um, have shown that we can move people on and off the ferries relatively quickly. And we certainly believe that the service frequency will ensure that uh, people will get more quickly between uh, Circular Quay and Manly and sure. Manly. Thank you, Mr. Collins. That is helpful. Um, but in that test that you just confirmed about 200 passengers being tested on the ferry, uh, it, did it take more than 15 minutes to offload those 200 passengers? And if so, uh, why have we bought them given that we can unload 1,100 passengers from the freshwater class in under 10 minutes? Uh, thank you for your question, Howard Collins. I don't have to hand the details of uh, those tests, so I will take that on notice. But I think we've already found with the current Emerald class, uh, which are identical in many ways to the, the, the further three we've ordered, that uh, as far as I'm aware, we haven't had any boarding or lighting issues. And whilst the arrangements at Manly are different, as you know, with the freshwater and the two deck configuration that um, regular use of these ferries on the manly service have not given us any increased delays, uh, even pre, uh, pre the sort of lockdown numbers that we're seeing recently. Uh, but obviously well, we'll you, work Tom. through and understand those issues. Mr. Secretary, the, the Minister for Transport announced that he intends to electrify smaller harbour ferries, including the river class fleet. Uh, how much is that gonna cost? Rob Sharp, uh, thank you for that uh, question. Uh, electrification uh, is a key agenda item in our sustainability strategy and uh, is subject to the normal business case processes that we uh, that we pursue. Uh, those has those this, costs are subject has this to- Has proposal been subjected to a business case, Mr. Sharp? No, this is a conceptual uh, stage of, of the vision. Uh, so our 2056 vision very clearly states that sustainability uh, is a key uh, uh, focus and agenda for transport. Uh, the well, South Wales government has also articulated its policy around achieving admission reductions of 35% and 50% uh, by 2050. So these strategies flow from that. Uh, as, as I mentioned, the uh, concept then gets taken into a business case uh, stage. Yep, no, and I'm, that's I'm, where I'm we, we, we need to look at the health benefits and other, other sure. broader benefits but, to justify the expenditure. Fair, when the minister made this announcement on the 11th of June, he didn't say it was conceptual and he certainly didn't reveal it hadn't been to a business case. Were you actually told about this announcement prior to the minister making it? Uh, I can confirm that uh, electrification of uh, ferries uh, is something I'm very aware of. In fact, I attended a, a meeting no, with no, the minister I appreciate that, to, to discuss it. I, I appreciate the minister's passion for this because at various forms of budget estimates, he's told us at great length. So it's not a shock that he intends to electrify the thing and it's not necessarily that we quibble with that. But the specific question to you, Mr. Sharp, was about this conceptual announcement. Were you told about it before the minister made it? Uh, yes, uh, I was uh, aware of it, as I just indicated. Uh, I have been in uh, meetings with the minister and some suppliers who uh, who talk to the electrification uh, of ferries. We uh, we have a, a technology group uh, that sits in my team that actually explores where these technologies are at, and we explore a number of these options and talk to a number of these options regularly. Okay, thank you. That's, that's, I appreciate that, Mr. Secretary. Can I just say, in respect to the, the minister's announcement committing to electrify the Sydney train network, is that equally at the conceptual stage or is that progress to the business case stage? Uh, in regards to the electrification of the rail, the uh, Sydney trains is electrified. It's got a very broad electric uh, uh, spread right up to uh, the north and up into the mountains. No, no, uh, I appreciate that it's electrified. <laughs> so let me rephrase. The, the proposal is why I think he, to shift it to a net zero position. Are we still in concept on that or is that uh, progressed to a business case stage? The, uh, the, move, the movement of uh, the electric elements of rail uh, towards zero is a uh, operational strategy. Uh, we have a number of programs that are focused on uh, actually reducing the usage of electricity, but also 
uh, the contractual arrangements around how we procure electricity. And uh, that is uh, live. Uh, those, those agreements and contracts are in place and uh, action as part of our operational uh, processes to procure electricity. Thank you, Secretary. Just final question about the ferries, the Emerald Class. Is it the case that TANSTEP have said that they're not going to take possession of them uh, because they leak, they can't survive swells, uh, they have less capacity? And is it the case that you're likely to be heading into court action with TransDev anytime soon? Uh, Rob Sharp, at a uh, macro level, what I would say is when we uh, contract with suppliers, uh, there are quite clear contractual commitments. Uh, we've uh, got a long-term uh, acquisition and uh, operational contract with TransDev, and uh, the contractual commitments are very clear in regards to uh, those arrangements. So are they likely to sue you, or are you likely to sue them for, not, uh, for the ferries not being up to standard? The... Uh, the contract is that uh, ferries get delivered to standard and uh, they are working through uh, those issues. So, for example, some of the items you mentioned are part of the testing and uh, implementation phase of uh, any new product that comes into uh, Transport for New South Wales. Uh, thank you, Mr Sharp. I'm going to move on now. Uh, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that, Mr Sharp. Thank um, you. Mr Sharp, I want to ask you some questions about the Transport Asset Holding Entity. Treasury has told us in their estimates that Tahi is going to be earning $785 million in net profit, well, in profit, uh, predominantly from revenue that's paid by Sydney Trains and New South Wales Trains. So how much is Sydney Trains paying Tahi this year? Uh, Transport for New South Wales has a number of contractual arrangements with uh, the asset holding company. Uh, the asset holding company uh, in fact, uh, has a number of contracts, not just with Transport, also with a number of other organisations, including uh, yep. uh, freight. So my question specifically is about assets. Sydney Trains and how in much is Sydney to, Trains uh, paying Tahi? In respect to uh, the last financial year, uh, the amount paid was zero. Uh, the arrangements have only just been put in place for the access fees uh, from 1 July. Uh, the Contracts uh, for standing up the Tahi operating model uh, all kicked in from 1 July this year. Sure, um, which under the shareholder agreement is late, uh, but incidentally, on that regulatory access regime, how has tra Sydney Trains and or Transport agreed to it, given that IPART is yet to make it? Uh, in respect to uh, the asset holding company, the access fees uh, are uh, calculated and have been reviewed uh, by transport. Uh, there's a number of asset holding company structures that are out there and they all typically use a building no, no, block. I'm asking you specifically about this one. I'm aware of the other ones, Mr Sharp, but I'm yes. asking you here, uh, given that the shareholder agreement required an independent regulatory access regime to be in place, there isn't one in place. IFIT hasn't done it. And basically, it's the case, is it not, that you've just agreed to what Tahi has told you. True? Uh, in respect to the two elements of your question, uh, the regulatory framework uh, is in place for the regulated assets. Uh, so for regulated assets, uh, the trade industry and others have a very defined uh, contractual process and uh, that remains in place. Uh, in respect to the charges that come to transport, as secretary, uh, I'm uh, needing to ensure that there is value for money for any fees that we pay. And uh, there's been an extensive exercise done by Transport for New South Wales, uh, reviewing the proposed charges and being comfortable that they represent value for money. And Thank you. Uh, those, are, treasury... those are based on industry norms, very similar to the regulated assets. Thank you. Mr Secretary, Treasury said that finding a leader for this $40 billion corporation was the responsibility of the transport cluster, and especially Tahi's board. And if there'd been a failure to secure a permanent leader, uh, it really was transport's job to call Tahi's board to account. Given that that was Treasury's views, why did transport let a company the size of Telstra go without a permanent CEO for more than a year? Uh, I can't talk specifically for Tahi, but uh, in regards to the timings, the uh, first year was used to actually set up the entity. 
uh, very complex uh, commercial arrangements and contract uh, negotiations, and they occurred over several months. Uh, there was a, an interim CEO during that phase, and uh, my understanding was that at stand-up, uh, Tahi was looking to have a permanent CEO appointed. That CEO is now in place and commenced on 1 September. Treasury, yeah, sorry, Transport Secretary, Transport's on documents flagged the need to have a permanent CEO on day one. The shareholder agreement that Tahi executed with the Treasurer and the Finance Minister said that it would have a permanent leadership. The idea that somehow that was just a job to get around to once the organisation took control of $40 billion isn't true. Uh, your own documents reveal that. So why is it again did Transport allow this to take place? And incidentally, given that you are on the Tahi board, what is the Tahi CEO's remuneration? Uh, in respect to uh, my role on the board, uh, as any uh, non-executive director, uh, the information that, that gets covered in the board is uh, confidential and you'd need to refer that specific question to the uh, Tahi organisation. I did, uh, for what it's worth. Um, and then I also asked the Treasury Secretary and the Treasury team, and they made it clear that the Treasurer had signed off on a remuneration range, but said that the specific level of remuneration was a decision of the Transport Ministers to provide concurrence. Given you're on the board, and given the portfolio minister has to provide concurrence, I'm asking you in your capacity as Transport Secretary, not in your capacity as a, as a TAHI director, but I'm sure you know, what is the TAHI CEO's remuneration and why is it such a secret? Uh, the Transport for New South Wales uh, role as Secretary uh, is not to set the remuneration of uh, the uh, TAHI CEO. Uh, that's the responsibility of the board, and uh, that question needs to be uh, specifically addressed to Tahi uh, in that uh, in that responsibility. As uh, as secretary, I I don't have input into the uh, setting of the remuneration of another entity sure. within government. Look, I appreciate that you you're not prepared to tell us as either transport secretary or as a Tahi board director. So I'll move on. Uh, we recently found out that transport was seriously considering turning itself into a for-profit corporation to prop up how Tahi is treated in the budget. Are you still secretly planning to turn the Transport for New South Wales into a for-profit corporation? Uh, turning Transport into a for-profit organisation is not something that I have heard of uh, or is in, in the uh, agenda that I have. Uh, so I'm not well, sure it was where recommended... the question comes from. It was recommended, well, it was, I refer you to some of the media coverage that I think was on the front page of the Herald maybe two, two weeks ago, but I appreciate um, you may not have seen it. But I'm referring to the Pricewaterhouse Coopers report that was prepared for Transport for New South Wales in December 19 that recommended that Transport for New South Wales turn itself into a state-owned corporation with a responsibility to make a profit uh, in order to prop up the Tahi budget treatment. So that's the context. Uh, if, I'm not sure whether you, you might thank, be thank aware of Thank you for of the clarification. Uh, I have, I have Are you still to, into uh, Thank you for the clarification. Yes, I am aware of the Price Waterhouse uh, report. And uh, in fact, there was a number of structuring uh, options that were canvassed in that. Uh, my understanding is that the key focus was actually on a number of accounting and uh, uh, potential structuring uh, uh, approaches for TAHI and that the new accounting standards were, were being looked at. Uh, there is no, uh, to answer your specific question around, are we looking to be a for-profit? The answer is no. When did that work cease? I believe the last uh, report was issued in uh, 2020. So this work which was a, a follow-up to the 2019 the report. Right, so there was a second report that recommended or canvassed this option? It was uh, simply an update, I understand, of the 2019 report, which was around accounting standards okay, and implementation of operating models. And did that recommend that the idea continue on or did that recommend that the idea be abandoned? Uh, I'd have to take on notice that specific question on the follow-up report. Sure. Thank you. Um, on notice, are you able to provide us a copy of the follow-up report? Or am I testing our friendship here, Mr Sharp? Uh, I'll, I'll take that on notice. Uh, 
Thank you. Mr Sharp, your predecessor raised serious concerns about the risks that the TAHI model poses to rail safety. What steps have you taken to assure yourselves that TAHI poses no risks to rail safety? Uh, any uh, secretary would uh, have uh, rail safety as a, a, a number one priority, and it's certainly my number one priority. Uh, not not just over our staff, but for all the commuters and uh, people that, that travel on uh, the uh, broader uh, rail network. Uh, the safety approaches have remained unchanged. Uh, we are responsible for the operations of the rail uh, network. Yep, but I'm asking uh, part you, of that what is steps maintenance. have you taken? What steps have you personally taken to assure yourself Tahi doesn't pose any risks to rail safety? Have you taken any? I've uh, been uh, intimately involved in the discussions around safety and the development of the commercial agreements over the last uh, five, six months. Uh, the reason for that is that it is important that uh, transport maintains uh, responsibility and accountability and the ability to underpin safety. And a key element of that is maintenance. And uh, the budget for maintenance, the strategy for maintenance and responsibility for maintenance uh, sits with me as secretary. Uh, so I have so, personally. As secretary, have you have you commissioned or ordered Transport to complete a safety risk assessment for itself on how TAHI is operating now and how it's expected to operate in the future? There, there were specific risk assessments performed uh, during the setup of TAHI, and our uh, safety team was pers was specifically involved in the uh, commercial agreement development. Uh, we also liaised with the safety authorities uh, during that process as well. Sure, but the TAHI has been operating for now for a, more than a year, and you've been secretary. Look, I accept that you've come into the secretaryship in recent times, but have you yourself commissioned a safety risk assessment on TAHI and how it's operating and how it's expected to operate? Given, as you just pointed out earlier, that its commercial arrangements are ongoing, it just has its new leader put in place, and it's still in the process of being stood up. When was the last time Transport commissioned a safety risk assessment for itself on how TAHI is operating? Uh, when you say commissioned a, a safety review, uh, we have actually performed uh, safety reviews uh, on this when? extensively. When was the last one, Mr. Sharp? The, the last one would have been in the last three months during the process of me coming on board. and. Uh, as you uh, rightly questioned, uh, what did I personally do to uh, satisfy myself on the safety? And the safety, uh, and I've concluded that the safety is absolutely underpinned by the commercial agreements, and we have uh, maintained the controls to ensure a safe operation. So if you just, given that you've just said that you've maintained the controls to ensure a safe operation, how then is it possible that we should be treating TAHI as an organisation which is genuinely independent of government. Can you explain to me how you resolve that contradiction? Uh, asset holding companies uh, are quite common and uh, there's various activities that sit with them. So for uh, TAHI, there's regulated assets and uh, primarily those are the assets that uh, transport users. So these are the rail tracks, for example, the country rail network. There's also uh, infrastructure which we use 100% in our own right, such as uh, railway stations, and there's access fees paid for those. Tahi also has unregulated Tahi. assets that it makes a commercial return on. So in terms of the, uh, the uh, structure, uh, Tahi is effectively an owner of assets, not an operator yeah, no, or a retainer of assets. But no, no, I'm aware of that. Um, but I guess my final question, because I think my time is up, is you control the maintenance though, don't you? Transport for New South Wales controls the maintenance. Great. Correct. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mookie. Uh, Mr. Banasiak. Thank you, Chair. Um, just picking up on the Chair's questions around West Connect, so I might go to you, Ms. Drover. Um, in, around June and July this year, there was a significant privacy breach by Western X, where they, they and the government published the full name, address, uh, lot number, and whether the property was under mortgage and who with um, in the government gazette. Um, what steps? Well, firstly, how often has has this privacy breach occurred? Is this a standard practice? Uh, 
that we we publish the personal details of people potentially um, having their um, land compensated for um, in the government gazette. Uh, Camilla Driver, thank you for the question. Look, I, I'm not uh, familiar with the incident you were referring to. I assume it relates to property acquisition. Yes. Yes, yeah, so I'll have to take on notice the and come back to you with what information we can on the specific incident. Um, but yes, as you rightly say, it's not uh, it is not practice uh, to obviously disclose the personal information of uh, property owners that we're acquiring land from. Thank you. So we're, when taking on that notice, can you um, come back to us with this? How often has this happened? Um, was this the first time someone complained about it? And obviously, what steps the department is taking to ensure that this doesn't occur again? Yes, happy to take that on notice and see what information we can bring back. Thank you. Um, I th think just going back to you, Mr. Sharp, uh, you were giving some detail about the 2056 uh, transport plan and you were talking about uh, that there's vision and aspirational targets um, and then there's finer details. Um, is it an aspirational target that all these projects listed within this 2056 uh, South East Sydney Transport Strategy um, I guess link with a proposed cruise ship terminal at Yarra Bay. Uh, is that a statement or a question? Is, is well, it, it, uh, it, is, is it is it part of your as the department's aspirations that all these projects somehow link as well to the cru proposed cruise ship terminal at Yarra Bay? Uh, I can't specifically talk to that. Um, the uh, long term plan as I mentioned earlier, to ensure connectivity across uh, key points and uh, modal intersections. Uh, that is still the plan. In terms of a cruise ship, I'm, I'm not across that particular point, and I'd have to uh, pass over to Megan uh, Burke O'Neill. Megan Burke O'Neill, thank you, Secretary. Um, no, I'm not aware of the cruise ship terminal being uh, directly connected into that 10 year blueprint, but we, I'm happy to take it on notice and see if we can get some information for you during the hearing. Thank you. Um, maybe sticking with you, Ms. Burke, um, unless you want to pass back to Mr. Sharp, can you explain what the link uh, with this uh, ferry project is to Hayes Dock? Is Hayes Dock uh, connected to this as well? Uh, thank you for your question, Megan Burke O'Neill. I won't pass back to the secretary. Um, he's passed to me on this and I will have to take that on notice, but I'll just pause for a moment and check in with our chief operations officer, Mr. Collins, to see if he has anything to add to this. Thank you for the question, Howard Collins. No, I don't have any further information provided at this stage, so I'm uh, quite happy for obviously this to be taken on notice. We will take it on notice. Thank you. While, while you are taking it on notice, it is, it's been noted that Hayes Dock in Port Botany is the preferred site for Royal Caribbean as an interim cruise ship terminal um, while Yarra Bay is being built. Um, so I will press a little bit and, and ask for, I guess, a clarification as to whether there is a connection between Hayes Dock uh these ferry services and the potential for the cruise ship terminal at Yarra Bay if we can get some confirmation about whether there's any interdependencies um particularly with the vi economic viability of some of these projects are they heavily reliant on a cruise ship terminal um being put in Yarra Bay um that would be appreciated thank you yes I'll, I'll see if we can find some information for you thank you um, I may, I might just go to um, another topic, and it may be for you, Mr. Carlon, um, regarding the current proposals um, for the Marine Safety Regulation Review. Would you be the best person to answer this? Uh, unless Mr. Collins has information available on this, with the specific question, we could. Um... See what that question is. Sorry. Yeah. So it's it's about the proposed regulations. You you put out marine safety. Put out two 
two options, um, particularly around life jacket uh, wearing. Um, and it's the fact sheet states that there was extensive evaluation and analysis process to evaluate the safety and stakeholder impacts of the reform of two, of the reform, and two options were developed. How does how does one evaluate stakeholder impacts without actually talking to stakeholders? Because uh, every 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 stakeholder that I know in boating and recreational fishing weren't consulted on these proposals. So, um, Bernard Carlon, so thank you for your question. Yes, um, we are in a process of consultation right now on the um, broader uh, uh, maritime safety plan for 2026. So within that maritime safety plan, um, two options with regard to the extension uh, and simplification of life jacket uh, uh, laws for adults. Uh, we've uh, had a number of workshops with a range of stakeholders, including the Maritime Advisory Council, um, the BIA and um, other uh, uh, stakeholder groups uh, uh, around the development of the uh, 2026 Maritime Safety Plan. Uh, and it was through those consultations that a, in particular, a simplification of the life jacket, current life jacket rules was um, raised as a um, priority within those consultations. Uh, and we're now uh, moving forward with, again, a month, uh, four weeks of consultation on two options, which have been um, developed for uh, wearing of life jacks, jackets to simplify the rules, but also to extend them, uh, certainly to extend them to um, six vessels underway that are uh, less than six metres in enclosed waters when underway, and um, all vessels on open waters in the open area of the vessel when underway. And another option, which is uh, simply on all vessels um, that are less than six metres when underway, um, and at all types of vessels um, that are um, less than six metres when boating alone or on alpine waters or in those. Yeah, I've I've um, I've, I've read I've read the fact sheet, uh, Mr. Carlon, so we won't go into too much detail there. But uh, if I could what... maybe add to that, uh, we actually went live with consultation on Friday. There's a website that's available. Yeah, I'm I'm aware of the website, but my concern was more about the fact that uh, the proposal and the plans and the options were came came up without wider consultation with with stakeholders. Um, particularly, you, you have a, a maritime recreational vessel advisory group or RVAD. Um, the Recreational Fishing Alliance is part of that. They the issue was never brought to that committee's attention. Um, why is that? It seems a perfect opportunity. You, ha you have a, I guess, a, a group of users um, of recreational vehicles, uh, vessels, um, and you didn't consult them. Uh, so actually, we've launched the consultation process uh, last Friday. So we're actually you know, inviting people. Um, yes, to but my my in the process now. My question is about <laughs> you didn't consult with these people when coming up with your two options. Um, and I, I don't think we're going to get an answer there. Um, you, you, you talked about the simplification of the the rules around life jackets and the vessels, and you mentioned six metres and 4.8 metres. What data or evidence do you have uh, to suggest that raising it to six metres um, actually, it, I guess, it achieves increased safety. Um, do you have any data that points to six metres being, I guess, a critical point in improving uh, safety? Yes, uh, Bernard Carlon. Uh, so we've done some detailed analysis of um, all of the drownings, uh, the, the maritime associated drownings for recreational vehicle uh, vessels um, in the last 10 years. Um, the extension in option A uh, of the um, to six metres and the requirements whilst um, underway. Uh, of the 98 lives that were presumed drownings as uh, part of those incidents, there were people tragically lost their lives. The analysis suggests that um, option A may save up to 56 of those lives had they been wearing life jackets. Uh, the extension cuts around 50% of the um, additional uh, vessels that would be regulated, 50% of the trauma. Uh, in option B, that goes to, um, by extending to six metres, um, 
uh, goes from uh, the 57, 57 to 67 lives, or 56, sorry, to 67 of those lives that would have been otherwise saved. 70% of those people who um, drowned in boating incidents were not wearing life jackets at the time. Yeah, I've only got about 30 seconds left, but I may ask you just on notice to provide, I guess, the source document for that research and that data, if you could, uh, Mr. Carlin. Yeah, I'm happy to take that on notice. Thank you. Um, I will throw to the chair. Thank you, Mr. Benassia. Um I think um, this is directed to you, uh, Mr. Sharp. Um, in fact, I know it's directed to you because I'm going to direct it to you. Um, I wanted to ask you, you talked earlier about the uh, future transport strategy, the 2056 um, strategy, uh, and identified the um, objective of sustainability, including this sort of rapid electrification of, of transport in order to reduce greenhouse and gas emissions. Um, the electric and vehicle, sorry, electric and hybrid vehicle plan uh, from 2019 uh, was a document that was, um, I guess, directed for you to provide or for you to produce uh, under that future transport 2056 document. Um, and it identified that road transport emissions are the second largest source of greenhouse gas emissions and the fastest growing source, um, and also one of the lowest cost opportunities for us to be able to reduce emissions. Was there anything in that document because uh, I've read it and I can't see it. Is there anything in that document um, suggesting that we should put a tax on drivers of electric vehicles? The uh, document talks about the uh, mechanisms of actually achieving uh, net reduction down from uh, what is actually 19% of the total emission. So transport right across New South Wales is generating 19%. The importance of your question is that uh, achieving that is is actually going to need to include addressing uh, motor vehicles and, and light commercial vehicles. So whilst we have electrification of rail and others, uh, we do acknowledge that uh, the motor vehicle is still uh, a, a main contributor to pollution. Uh, the, the actual uh, vision statement of 2056 talks to outcomes. Uh, not necessarily the detailed mechanisms. And so my role is to take the 10 year blueprint and turn that into uh, business plans and tangible deliverables for transport for New South Wales. And uh, those uh, are underpinning uh, achieving those objectives of the net zero. So the actual uh, package of uh, motor vehicle investments includes a user charge. Uh, it includes incentives to uh, to get the motor vehicle industry going. And this is actually to enable a faster take up of, of electric vehicles in New South Wales. Could I, um, can I perhaps put it to you that the package of reforms um, that was uh, announced recently included a number of things which you had already had in your electric and hybrid vehicle plan um, in relation to um, you know, uh, charging infrastructure and so on. None of that is, is new. But what we had um, was a really quite controversial tax on electric vehicles embedded within, um, for marketing reasons, no doubt, a uh, package of, of what you might call incentives, but would be sort of the bare minimum that people might do um, to incentivize electric vehicle usage. A little bit like uh, when I give my dogs their medicine wrapped in, um, in peanut butter. That's how I see the, the, the user tax. So if we could just focus on the EV tax itself, it's correct to say, is it not, that it was not included in the 2019 document transport produced for the electric and hybrid vehicle plan? Uh, the, I would have to take on notice that exact document. However, uh, I do note that uh, a user charge is not a surprising element in that other jurisdictions have uh, gone down this path, and it is actually a part of the solution of actually funding roads, given that uh, ultimately uh, the duties that are received few, through fuel uh, will need to be uh, replaced. Uh, so the packages are a balanced outcome in terms of achieving that electrification agenda. And perhaps we could have an argument about whether replacing a federal uh, levy with a state um, revenue source is 
is perhaps just opportunism um, rather than... So it's one, one for the government, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, my question then is, given the, um, the Minister for Transport's quite outspoken opposition to the road user charge and the idea of a tax on electric vehicles, um, why was transport, or the question really is, was transport um, for New South Wales actually um, consulted on the Treasurer's plan? Uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, in my time here, uh, consultation across the clusters uh, is working well. And uh, yes, we were uh, advised and also included in consultation. Uh, we provided uh, quite a lot of the input uh, to Treasury in regards to this. U ultimately, a, a new tax does sit with uh, Treasury to uh, issue, but uh, we were consulted and we provided input. Is transport concerned that it won't be able to do its part in getting New South Wales to net zero emissions due to the introduction of a road user tax on EVs that could actually further disincentivise electric vehicle uptake? Uh, transport uh, for New South Wales uh, does see itself as a leader in delivering sustainable solutions. Uh, it's not about one single item. Uh, in reality, this is a very complex uh, task and is multifaceted. So it covers all modes of transport. It includes incentives, uh, and they do need to be balanced. Uh, ultimately, uh, one item does not uh, undermine uh, a full sustainability agenda. So uh, in response to your question, I'm satisfied that transport uh, will achieve its sustainability agenda. We have specific streams of activity. They're well advanced. Uh, we're pursuing it. And uh, transport staff are passionate about doing their bit uh, to address the challenges of climate change. As Secretary for Transport in New South Wales, do you intend to follow uh, the electric and hybrid vehicle plan that was put out in 2019? Or your earlier answer seemed to imply that you were looking only at the Future Transport 2056 document. Uh, no, we uh, have a, a number of strategy documents and inputs from a large number of people. Uh, we are evolving our strategies and uh, and we continue to put uh, new plans out uh, for consultation. In fact, we've just issued uh, to uh, the bus industry a e, uh, an e-bus uh, strategy uh, paper for input. And uh, we'll continue to uh, do these uh, consultations and, and strategy engagement sessions because the technology is rapidly moving. Uh, battery technology, even two years ago, is radically different to the battery technology that's available today. Uh, likewise with the buses, uh, we have buses getting manufactured in Australia now, which are actually leading edge in terms of the battery and efficiency. Uh, so engagement is the key to it and we'll be uh, agile in terms of getting inputs on those as these technologies develop and roll those into the broader plan. Did Minister Constance oppose the introduction of an EV tax? when it was brought to uh, from Treasury? I can't talk uh, for the Minister in that regard. Uh, you'd have to uh, ask uh, the Minister directly on that. Did Transport oppose the EV tax as part of the um, so-called package of reforms for electric vehicles? Uh, tra tra transport. Tra Sorry, I'm just getting feedback here. Uh, tra transport uh, provided input into uh, the uh, process of that package. And uh, it is a balanced package. Uh, transport is always providing its input if there are other clusters that are uh, driving strategy so that the transport agenda is fully uh, acknowledged. I would expect so. So was that input in the, in the, uh, the form of opposition or support? Uh, it was in, in uh, support. Uh, as I indicated earlier, uh, Chair, the... Uh, it's a package that is actually required to deliver uh, these sustainability uplifts. And often these packages include incentives, but also uh, mechanisms to actually pay for uh, the uh, transport that is being delivered. Are you, sorry, are you suggesting now that the um, road user charge itself is going to be used to pay for EV infrastructure charging? What's the... Uh, no, I'm not, not, in, not inferring that. Uh, we, we have uh, infrastructure uh, budgets that were announced as part of uh, the package. 
And uh, there's a combination of uh, the NRMA, ourselves, and uh, planning that are actually delivering uh, infrastructure, uh, charging infrastructure. And that's going to actually take away that anxiety element that uh, is holding back some people uh, from moving across to uh, electric vehicles. Okay, but what was the reference then um, in your previous answer to requiring the package to include elements that would pay for the rest of the package? No, apologies, I was just answering your question where you said, had we actually commented on the tax uh, or the or the user charge that had been uh, put up by uh, Treasury? And what I was uh, saying was that, yes, we had input into that and we acknowledged that there was a package uh, that was being presented, which included the infrastructure, included the user charge, included stamp duty waivers and a, a whole lot of other incentives uh, to drive what it is, uh, has been acknowledged by the electric vehicle industry as a, a leading package to, uh, to support electric vehicles. Thank you. I will need to leave it there. Um, I will hand over to the opposition. Right. Thank you, Chair. I might turn Secretary Sharp to what the Premier inadvertently referred to as Tolmania. Uh, data referred to by the Herald today confirms community concerns that while cars are using the M5 East and M8 corridors, trucks are not, they're on suburban streets. How does this publicly available data compared to the Transport for New South Wales analysis 14 months after the M8 has opened? Uh, in respect to uh, specific data, uh, I'd have to refer to um, uh, Ms Burke O'Neill just in regards to the movements of uh, traffic and the data that you've uh, referred to. <clears throat> Thank you, Secretary. Megan Burke O'Neill. Um, yes, the, um, the opening of the M8 and the M5 East about 12 months ago now, or just over, um, has um, obviously been a major um, component into that part of the network. And since opening, we've seen good utilisation on the new infrastructure, the M8, but we have also observed um, a period of adjustment on the surrounding roads. And that's sort of pretty normal um, with any new sort of motorway. And there will be that period of adjustment as drivers um, make their choices about their travelling. We did anticipate some increases in traffic around surrounding roads, and we have observed that. Um, in terms of, I think your question, if I can clarify, was on the M8 and the M5 East itself. Could I just get, hear that question again? Yes, well, I might ask you this question, given your answer, or to Secretary Sharp. The article today from the Herald has the review that Transport for New South Wales <laughs> was conducting into this that should have been released 12 months after the opening, now with no timeline for its release. When will the community see that review of traffic in a lot more detail than yeah. you're providing this committee today? Yes, thanks for your question. I can answer that question. Um, to meet the, um, the project conditions of the original planning approval for the M8, Transport is required to produce a full road network performance review plan at 12 months from the project commencing. So we've certainly started that um, and actually we need to do it five years after it's commenced as well. Um, so we've started- I want to know when you'll finish it. That's the community's concern. When will it yeah. be finished? The contract that's been issued ends on the 31st of December this year. Are we going to see this study this year? So we've- commence the work on the study. And I think our challenge at the moment is we're not in a normal traffic environment because of the COVID-19 travel restrictions. And in fact, it has been a challenge in um, over the past 12 months, we have not been at a full kind of road traffic volume return. The data has been really variable. And um, because of that, we need to ensure we're gonna get a more accurate picture of the traffic impacts we don't, do know there have been some. We do know there have been increased volumes on the surrounding road network. Um, Is but the in plan to release the study this year, given those uncertainties that you're outlining? Yeah, so I think it's we need to properly evaluate the impact of traffic by giving it a little bit more time until we return to more normal conditions. But it won't be this year. It was promised mid-year. It won't be this year. Is that what you're telling us? It may not be. I think... We do need to take the time to actually understand how um, both 
a bit of time to see more normal traffic conditions. Right. And also Thank there's you for a that answer. I might. I'm going to have to move to another issue. Sorry because of the time, but I appreciate the answer. Secretary Sharp, I want to ask about a piece of land that we've talked about at estimates before. It's West Connect's residual land in Homebush, a 4,600 uh, 4, square kilometre block between Underwood Road and Ishmay Avenue. Uh, it's been used in temporary construction. It was promised uh, to be returned to the community. Minister Ayres, before the election, said uh, this and therefore the land is not being considered for sale. The local candidate said he re received confirmations the land wouldn't be sold. Uh, the community is now concerned it will be sold by Transport for New South Wales. Can you update the committee about this issue? Uh, thank you for the question. I'm not uh, privy to that particular uh, block and the status of it, but I will pass it as Drover uh, maybe across the detail on that one. Thank you. Thank you for the question, uh, Camilla Drover. Um, look, I haven't got the specifics of that particular parcel of land, but what I can say, um, obviously we acquired land for the purposes of construction for West Cadex, um, and at the end of construction there is residual land uh, left over. All of those parcels of land are considered and um, are assessed as part of a residual land management plan. And each one of those plans is done for every stage of West Connects. Um, I am aware that that parcel of land was included in the residual land management plan. Um, it is assessed uh, with our planning approver, DPI, um, but I'm not across the exact status of, of that parcel of land. So happy to take Ms. that. Governor, just to clarify, this, this isn't a suburban block. This is 18 hectares of land. It's bigger, the land available is bigger than Hyde Park. Uh, these were clear commitments that this land wouldn't be sold. Can you repeat that commitment today that this land will not be sold? I'd have to uh, take that on notice and, uh, and check the exact status of, of where it is in the residual land management plan and, and what plans are for that parcel. Thank you. I'll hand to my colleague, Mr. Mookie. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. This might be a question that you, Mr. Robert, may also need to answer. Um, the CEO of the Bowman Tigers went public with his frustration uh, that the future of his club is called into jeopardy because Transport for New South Wales is acquiring the Roselle site that used to house the Tigers. Uh, I understand that you're in dispute. You made your position clear in the paper this morning. But is it the case that Transport is currently investigating an alternative dive site for the Western Harbour Tunnel and the Northern Beaches Link project? So is that question to myself or the Secretary? Yeah. To you, Ms. Driver or Mr. Secretary, oh. however you see fit. Uh, Camilla Driver, I'm happy to uh, ah. take the question. Uh, although I might just need to clarify, is the question whether we are in dispute? Yeah, with are you the, looking uh, at an alternative site, dive site, uh, despite having already issued a property acquisition notice to take over the West uh, Tigers historic home uh, in Roselle? Okay, just a couple of points of clarification. Um, the, the Tiger site um, is the preferred tunneling site for the Western Harbour Tunnel, as outlined in the EIS, uh, which we've received approval for. So that's still our current plan. Uh, we obviously um, haven't commenced procurement of the Western Harbour Tunnel, and therefore we don't know if the exact uh, solution that we were offered by but, uh, the contractor. Um, so there is always the opportunity that, although it is our preferred site, based on all the best knowledge we have, that when we get a preferred contractor, they may come along with a different um, uh, proposal and therefore the site may not be needed. If I can just comment okay. on the position status. No, just, just in terms of, look, I appreciate that, but the question was about whether or not you are investigating an alternative site. And you said that basically, yes, you are. A preferred uh, contractor might come in and look at it. Um, but can I ask, is the fact that you are looking, is the reason why you haven't concluded an agreement with the developer uh, of this site is basically to drag out the acquisition process until the alternate dive site is sourced and secured and therefore you would end up paying far less than you would otherwise would? Okay, Camilla Drover, just on the first matter, we're not actively pursuing an alternative dive site. In terms of the acquisition status, um, we started uh, engagement with the landowner, Heworth, 
uh, back in 2018 when the concept design for the project was, was first displayed. We've had very uh, active uh, discussions and engagement with that landowner since then. Um, so much so that originally we were looking for an outright acquisition of the site, um, but through discussions with Heworth, um, their preference was that we take a construction lease. So the intent is that we take a construction lease for the period of construction, which means that when construction is finished and we're, we're finished with the use of yeah, that no, site. Yeah, no, I appreciate the status. Yeah. So, it, it, and if I can just. If you have to take on notice the detail, that's fine, because I need to move on to the other acquisition, which I wanted to ask Mr. Regan about, that uh -huh. Sydney Metro is embarking upon. Uh, Mr. Regan, uh, Sydney Metro has seized through a forced acquisition uh, the base that belongs to Sydney Helicopters. Uh, why have you failed to reach an agreement with them uh, about the value of their site? And do you accept that Sydney Metro uh, has effectively ruined this business and devastated the lives of its owners and its staff who have been in touch with me and others uh, just talking about the level of distress that they have experienced as they've had to negotiate with your organisation. So Peter Regan, I thank you for the question. Uh, the intent of any property acquisition that we make is to reach commercial agreement with the owners. And we work uh, very hard to try and reach a commercial agreement. Uh, we can't force a commercial agreement on any owner, uh, but we try our best to reach an agreement with them um, for the acquisition of the land or the relocation um, of a business on that land. Um, I don't have all the detail of the specific site you mean uh, that you've referred well, to. You, uh, but I could understand. you get back to me on this? Because, Mr. Regan, the, I accept that you might not always reach commercial agreement with landowners. And in fact, this is a, a framework that envisages dispute. But the, the owner of this particular business is telling me that they can't even get replies to correspondence. They can't even get offers to be put on the table and that effectively you, your organisation has uh, wasted time in order to force it into a valuation process by the Valuer General. If you're not in a position to respond to that, can you take that on notice? Well, I'm happy to take on notice um, to respond to the status of that process. But what I can also assure you that we do actively work on every acquisition to try and reach agreement where we can't. There is a process that owners can go through through the value of general. We do not sort of obfuscate from attempting to reach agreement. So I'm happy to look at the particular details of that. Thank you. I'll pass to my colleague, Mr. Padigi. Thanks, Chair. Um, perhaps to to you, Secretary Sharp, this, um, this pertains to the new inner city fleet, which you'll be aware was purchased from, uh, from Korea. There was a lot of controversy at the time, you recall, with regards to the uh, the trains being too wide for what's known as the 10 tunnel deviation in the Blue Mountains. Uh, are you able to, to elaborate on the cost blowout that was associated with uh, the subsequent fitting of those carriages into the tunnels? Uh, Rob Sharp, thank you for that question. Uh, I'm happy to uh, advise that the capital budget of 2.8 billion, uh, that envelope, we are still within that envelope. Uh, in terms of a cost blowout, uh, that, that would only occur if there was unexpected events. Uh, in fact, so the just on that, just on that, Secretary Sharp, just for my benefit. So that capital budget, you just, you, what did you say? 2.8 billion was 2 it? 2.8 billion. That was not revised. That was the capital budget envelope from the beginning, was it? Yes. And it included the tunnelling uh, works uh, because the plan was to actually uh, do the tunnelling works. It was a conscious decision to do so. Uh, and in fact, it's not the first time that that's occurred uh, with, with the electrification of the rail, the tunnel works were also done. So typically with any new fleet, uh, the technology changes, uh, the customer expectations around the product changes. And as part of the uh, project, that tunnel works was uh, already envisaged. So can I, can I just take you to uh, a related question on that then? If if it were the case that that, um, 
that those tunnel works didn't have to be done. In other words, the, the trains were fit for the current infrastructure. Would, how much would that have saved off that capital budget? I'd have to uh, revert to you. I, I don't know the specific dollars associated with that tunnelling work, but ha happy to take that on notice. If you take that on notice, that'd be great. Then in, in a related uh, line of questioning pertaining to the fact that those trains, those 10 car trains um, were too long for several platforms. Um, and, and as a result, several of those platforms had to be extended would you would you be able to avail us of the cost that was associated with that uh in regards to the question uh, i'll i'll take on notice those costings uh reality uh those platforms uh were the decision was to actually extend from eight cars to uh, 10 cars quite specifically to improve the operational efficiency and additional capacity uh, which is a very cost effective way of delivering capacity it was quite well known, particularly on the southern line, uh, that some platforms would be extended uh, to support the 10 uh, car operation. But I will revert uh, on the costs. And have all those remediation extension works been done that need to be done, or are they they're more in the pipeline? Uh, the uh, southern line is uh, a two year a program to actually uh, upgrade the tracks, the signalling uh, and the platform extension. Uh, a lot of that was associated with uh, network upgrades that were required in any event. Uh, that program has commenced and finishes in about, I believe it's about uh, 12 months uh, time. Okay, uh, if you could if you could give us the projected cost of that, uh, that extension work as well, that would be good if you could take that on notice. Um, I just want to take you to the safety issues, which have been also well publicised in terms of the operation of those trains and the interlocking system not allowing uh, the traditional view of guards to monitor um, pedestrian traffic on entering and exiting platforms and the restrictions of the associated CCTV. Uh, are you comfortable having recently taken over that uh, that safe operation would be guaranteed, notwithstanding those limitations I've just outlined, which which I might add are, are also the concerns of the people who'll be operating those trains. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, safety is a, a number one priority uh, for the organisation and for me. Uh, I, I have personally ridden on the train uh, and spent time uh, with the uh, technical folk and the drivers uh, and the guards on that train. Uh, there has been quite a bit of work done in this space. Uh, in fact, there's been over 200 consultation meetings uh, with our staff in the development of, uh, of the train. The technology that's actually used is uh, safe. Uh, it is actually used in Japan and the UK. And we've also had independent reviews done to give comfort that uh, the expertise around these uh, new technologies and the introduction of them uh, would uh, operate in a safe and effective manner. Yeah, ultimately, I, I, I don't want to regulate, be rude, but uh, I'm conscious of the time. I just want to take you directly to the question. Uh, the question was, are you absolutely certain and comfortable that the level of safety will be maintained, notwithstanding those those limitations? Yes, I am. OK, um, I just want to take you to some industrial action now that uh, that uh, Transport for New South Wales has been involved with with its employees. Um, Related to those safety concerns, the um, there was a there was a case where barristers were engaged. I can give you the name of those if you like: uh, Ian Neal, senior counsel; Simon Meehan, Michael Seck, um, Rene Kumar. These were briefed by solicitors Landers and Rogers, and it was with regards to staff being concerned about about staffing the NIF given those concerns. Are you able to tell us how much that action costs? I understand it went for a period of some four days. Is that right? I'd, I'd have to take on notice the actual dollars associated uh, with that action. Uh, what I can say is that uh, in regards to any fair work action or staff related matters, we do engage uh, legal consultation through those processes, uh, but I'll revert specifically on, on the dollar amount for your uh, question. 
you'd be aware that the court ruled in favour of the union and, and your employees in that matter on safety? Yes, sir. I, I am aware that there was a, a ruling uh, in regards to the employee. Uh, I would have to revert in terms of whether it was in regards to safety because uh, uh, normally the actions are in regards to behaviours. Well, if you could get back to us on the cost, because I think it's it's relevant that the taxpayer understand just how much money has been spent on this project, both in... Yeah, con confirming, I've taken that on notice. The other thing I wanted to ask you was that there was a separate action with regards to a protected action ballot that, uh, that your employees wanted to take. And there was, again, um, Andrew Gottling, who's a barrister, briefed by solicitors Lander and Rogers, Vanja Balut, another barrister, briefed by Safarth Shaw. Um, are you able to tell us what the cost of that particular action against the union or employees were, was? Uh, yes, I'll have to take that on notice. I'm not, not privy to the costs on that particular uh, matter. And then finally, sec finally, Secretary, there was a um, a rostering system which was being proposed by by Transport for New South Wales, whereby staff would um, personnel those trains, and it was an individual workplace dispute. Now the union took it to Fair Work, and there was a conciliation uh, hearing, and yet again. Again, Transport for New South Wales has thrown very high paid legal counsel for what seems like a fairly innocuous ask. A conciliation, as you would know, is simply sitting down with sitting down with the commissioner and trying to sort it out. Um, do you know how much that costs the taxpayer, that particular action? Uh, once again, uh, I'd have to take uh, the cost of any actions uh, on notice, and, and I've noted that one. Do you think? Do you think? Do you think it would concern? Yeah, I think it would concern the average taxpayer secretary that such large amounts of money on expensive legal counsel would be thrown uh, for for what seems like fairly valid cases. I'm in that point of order, yeah, because that's actually uh, for an opinion. It's uh, not not uh, appropriate. I'm sorry, the the time has expired. But what was your point of order, Mr. Fang? I didn't catch that. Oh, uh, Mr. Bargi was asking for an opinion, and uh, that's clearly not appropriate uh, from uh, the members. Did you want to speak to that point of order, Mr. Bargi? Or well, all, all I would say is, is that the as the secretary of the department, he's responsible for efficiently allocating taxpayers' money, and I would have thought that taxpayers have a right to know <laughs> how that judgment is made. Thank well, you. To that point, uh, Mr. Bargi uh, expressly asked, um, "Do you uh, do you?" You know, believe, and that's asking for an opinion where I think okay. uh, it's clearly Thank inappropriate. You. I have enough to rule. Um, if uh, if there is a, a matter of um, policy or opinion being um, requested and the witness feels that they cannot answer it, they are free to say so. Um, the opposition's time has expired. I will go over to uh, Mr. Buttigieg. No. no, Mr. Buttigieg's had a go. It's my turn now. Oh. <laughs> Oh, you marks. Sorry, Mr. Yes. Thank you. Um, I just sitting with the questions around the uh, life jacket review, um, Mr. Carlong. How much money will be invested, uh, or is proposed to be invested, in education awareness about this change once it is implemented? Uh, Bernie Carlong. Uh, so it's also within the plan, the draft plan, which is our for consultation, that we would have a significant reboot of the old and new program and focusing on if um, the changes which are being consulted on either of the options were adopted, that we would have a major campaign and community engagement program that would actually um, deal directly with in a similar way to when the changes were made around a decade ago in the um, of a new program, although it's been made clear by stakeholders that there are a whole range of other new issues to do with maintenance of life jackets that would be useful to include in that program as well. Um, before I finish, um, just in, to clarify the um, question that you asked um, previously, uh, we did have um, stakeholder workshops in December and in April, uh, so in December 2020, April 2021. Uh, and members of the Recreational Vessels Advisory Group were invited to both workshops. 
uh, and uh, that included the Recreational and Fishing Alliance as a member of the RVAG and um, they, uh, the Recreational Fisher Alliance member did actually attend the workshop in December. Okay, thank you. Is there going to be any recurrent funding? Uh, because I note that when we got the Rock Fishing Safety Act of 2016, there was no actual funding attached to it and hasn't been any funding attached to actually providing education. So will part of that campaign, will there be an annualised recurrent funding um, around education? Uh, so it's been the case that the Maritime Safety Plan and all of the actions under the, the Maritime Safety Plan have been funded um, by the Waterways Fund and it, um, it's intended to continue to support with education, all of the elements of the Maritime Safety Plan going forward. Okay, with the with the two options posed in the fact sheet, why wasn't the, the full details of the proposal or proposals included? Because when a member of the public goes to submit the survey, they have been bombarded with the list of other potential options, um, such as QR codes at boat ramps, increased surveillance via drones, to name a few. Um, it's been report, complained to me by constituents that it, it seems a bit disingenuous to not include those details of proposals up front in the fact sheet and sort of hiding it within the survey. Oh, certainly that's not, Burton Cullen, certainly that's not the intention. The, the, the consultation process, um, although it does include um, the, the mandatory wearing of black jacket um, options, is actually about the the all of the maritime safety plan proposals for 20 uh, from between now and 2026 um, and certainly the survey is um, structured around that um, there is intended to be and there's an option in the have your say website to for members of the community to actually attend a um, a workshop as well um, so a forum on the 14th of september um, where people can actually, again, engage in um, providing their views of all of the elements of the uh, Maritime Safety Plan 2026 and the two options um, which are being consulted on for life jacket wearing. Okay. Just picking up on your comments on the Waterways Fund, this, this is a fund that receives significant contribution um, from boat owners uh, through their, obviously, their boating licences and their registrations. Why haven't boaters been able to see proper financials of that fund um, since 2011? The details on, on the website from beyond 2011 are fairly scarce. Um, and it's been raised with me that it's a, you know, a concern of constituents that they're contributing to this fund and they're not actually seeing uh, detailed financials of how that money is being spent or how their money is being spent. Uh, Bernard Cullen, so I'm happy, to, and thank you for the question. I'm happy to take that on notice, noting that uh, more generally that um, there are significant programs like Boating Now, which has been a significant in increase in investment in boating infrastructure um, across New South Wales waterways, um, comes to that fund, the campaigns around um, boating safety and the other programs which are delivered in terms of boating safety right across New South Wales. Um, being supported by the Waterways Fund um, um, are continuously promoted and um, information made available, um, but happy to, again, take on notice the specifics of your question. Thank you. And probably just a couple of final questions. The Cooks River boat ramp just off General Holmes Drive uh, in Bayside Council, when will that be built? We have an update on when that's going to be built. Mr. Carlin, are so you able to answer that? This is a matter that um, uh, um, Mr. Howard would be um, better, or Mr. Collins would be have a better position to answer or take on notice. Howard's sure, Mr. Collins. Thank you for the question, Howard Collins. Um, I will, if I can, secure that detail before the end of this committee. I will certainly provide that for you. Obviously, we have a significant two hundred and five million dollar program and uh, significant boat ramps have been installed across the state. But if I can get you that information that you ask, I'll make sure I can get that either now or on notice. Sure. While you are, while you are seeking that information, I, I believe it wasn't through a boating now program, but it was actually funded through the Newcastle Port 
deal and it's my understanding that the money that has been received through that deal uh, will fall short of what Bayside Council propose it will cost. So um, any details about how that gap in uh, costings and what's been funded will be made up would be um, appreciated as well. Thank you for your question. Thank you. I'll pass to Ms Boyd. Thank you, Mr Benasiak. Um, uh, Chair, spoke... uh, sorry, uh, just to, as you know, Mr Carlon actually has uh, answers to the data that was requested in regards to the uh, uh, mobile camera uh, questions ah. earlier. Thank you, uh, Mr Carlon. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Bernie Carlon. So in response to the questions that were asked um, with regard to the contract that was issued um, um, appointing both AccuCensus and Redflex to the two um, areas, um, AccuCensus to the south and uh, Redflex to the north, uh, the AccuCensus being a new provider uh, actually suffered quite significant um, operationalization of the program's um, impact from COVID-19. Um, including some uh, significant impacts in their ability to purchase vehicles um, and vehicle fit out prior to the commencement of the contract um, and also establishing new COVID safe mechanisms and onboard and training of workers um, in order for them to implement. Um, there was a short term impact on their deliver ability to deliver within the program, which was negotiated, noting that uh, the, the contract actually um, accommodate, say, growth in hours up until the end of the year um, to meet the 21,000 hours. Um, and we're confident that that um, will actually now be able to be delivered and they have already started expanding their um, uh, vehicles that they they're have available um, and their enforcement activity during the following month. Um, currently, AccuCensus full operational fleet has grown from three to 14 vehicles um, and they are ramping up in order to meet their contractual obligations by the end of the year. And Redflex have 45 cars and are contracted to deliver slightly more hours um, and uh, again are in a position where they're able to deliver um, based on the um, 21,000 hours by the end of the year. Um, as they already had pre-existing vehicles, they were able to um, deliver in their region from the 1st of July. Uh, and I'd as well point out that um, whilst uh, there's this short-term impact in July, uh, with regard to the current road toll, you know, we are actually at, um, for the 12 months, at 280 fatalities, which is the lowest on record by some since the 1920s. Um, and we are seeing continued um, sustained decreases. Um, and when this program is operationalized, um, you know, uh, all of the evidence points to it also significantly contributing to an additional 32 to 43 lives saved every year um, following the full implementation at the end of the year of the 21,000 hours. Thank you, Mr. Carl. Um, I've just got a few questions and then I'll pass back to the opposition. Um, some questions in relation to the more bank intermodal transport exchange and um, the plans being made to protect koala habitat. Um, I'm not sure who to direct that to. Uh, Mr. Sharp. Uh, I'll pass that across to Ms. Burke O'Neill. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Ms. Birkenleal, I understand that the proposed realignment of Moorbank Avenue in order to serve that exchange will now cut through a previous biodiversity offset um, known as the bootlands, which consists of a koala bushland corridor and swampland. Um, if that proposed realignment is approved, what budgetary allocation is being made by Transport for New South Wales? Um, to ensure that a koala and other sort of wildlife underpass is being made. Thanks for your question, um, Megan Burke O'Neill. Um, maintaining koala habitats a really crucial part of our program of infrastructure upgrades, and we certainly take it seriously. Um, we're working really closely with DPI, with other colleagues right across government, to make sure that our infrastructure development um, does aligned to the koala strategy, to the different strategies in place for place um, as implemented by DPI. 
Just in terms of the Moore Bank um, terminal, I'm not across the details of that particular um, project, but I am happy to take that one on notice and come back to you. That would be really useful. I'll just give you a few others in relation yes. to that project, yeah. if you could take it on notice as well. So there's yeah. that one. Um, there's also um, the proposed upgrade of Cambridge Avenue um, uh, in Cassula Moore Bank. Um, Cassula, sorry, Moore Bank. Uh, Again, what budget's being set aside to provide underpasses there um, to prevent uh, wildlife roadkill and habitat loss threats. Uh, then there's a um, apparently feasibility study has been conducted um, by DPI and Transport for New South Wales for an underpass uh, at the notorious Deadman's Creek Bridge on Heathcote Road in Sandy Point. Yes. Um, again, what budgetary allocation has been made for the provision of a koala underpass there? Um, and finally, how is Transport for New South Wales and DPI progressing in funding the provision of multiple wildlife crossings through known koala habitat on Appin Road, um, where roadkill has been a notorious problem? Yes, um, thank you, Ms Boyd. I can answer a couple of those particular <laughs> queries, so I'll do so. Um, Appin Road, uh, the upgrade there and the road safety improvements is certainly a priority for us. Uh, vehicle strike in that area has been a real concern, we know, and um, we are working really hard with DPI at the moment to work through the right treatments um, and the appropriate koala protection. So our plan for Appen Road is to install koala fences on either side specifically to um, prevent koala strike, but underpasses are also under consideration. You may be aware that um, a developer there, Lend Lease, has proposed two underpasses and DPI it has formed technical panels in order to assess that. Um, they are also assessing both those, the proposal for the underpasses, but what protections are needed in context of um, their chief scientist and engineers report into the measures to protect the koala corridors and habitat in the Campbelltown region. So those pieces of work will come together. We're supporting DPI's investigations into that, and it's ultimately them who will advise on what, what the right treatments are, and certainly we've got to get to the right solutions. Um, it's a pretty complex project with a few stages, but once we have those directions and outcomes of the DPI work, we'll be able to continue that project development into detailed design. In terms of Heathcote Road, um, what I can tell you is we I will need to take on notice the budget that you've asked for, the budget question. Um, but we are working again with DPI and other stakeholders, including a couple of councils and others, to carry out two site inspections at Deadman's Creek, and that occurred earlier this year. And we're awaiting a report back to us about um, the options to for the best koala treatments in that area. Thank you. Um, if, yes, if you could take the rest on notice, that would be fantastic. Um, very final question um, in relation to the Greater MacArthur Growth Area. Um, my question is what funds have been set aside to ensure that roads are in place and can support the quick and efficient evacuation of new and existing residents and their pets within the Greater MacArthur Growth Area in times of a bushfire? Um, um, yes, yeah, so I will take your question on notice to come back to you with that. Thank you very much. Uh, back to the opposition. Thank you, Chair. Um, to you, Mr Secretary, can I ask, is Transport for New South Wales considering making vaccination a requirement for any person who wishes to travel on public transport? Thank you very much. Uh, the treatment of uh, vaccines in the broader community or, or the requirements are actually set by health. Uh, and we follow uh, public health orders in regard to those requirements. But are you thinking about imposing that requirement yourself independent of any health order are you, or are you going to wait for the health department to give you advice? Uh, we follow the health department's advice in regard to the broader community. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, in regards to our own staff, we're in the process of reviewing the risks associated uh, with transitioning back post-COVID uh, Delta variant. Sure, but look, Canada has uh, flagged that this will be a requirement in their jurisdiction. So is it a case that we're looking at international examples or any other form of model that could be used here that would tie an ability of a person to travel to their vaccination status? 
Uh, look, thank you for your question, but the uh, the question uh, I believe needs to be pointed to health uh, because that's a broader community uh, vaccine uh, question. Okay, can I? Do you have information about how many passengers have contracted COVID nineteen uh, as a result of an exposure on public transport? Uh, I don't specifically, but I'll pass across to uh, Mr. Collins, uh, who may be able to provide some more uh, clarity on that particular question. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Thank you very much for the question, Howard Collins. Um, I do not have specific information uh, regarding any uh, information from health regarding transmission. Uh, I think, uh, as publicly known, most of those uh, transmissions have either occurred at the home, family members, and also uh, in the community. Uh, we do, uh, when requested by health, if there is a particular bus uh, route or, or train uh, which uh, we've identified or health have identified, we do make the inquiries and checks. The good news is we have a lot of CCTV Opal data to well, assist us to ensure that we understand that. The question arises because health has published multiple instances in which bus routes train routes have been listed as exposure sites. Given that Transport has made clear that you've got a crisis working group um, that apparently meets daily on this, um, do you at least have information as to what the last available figure was or even a range as to the amount of people who may have uh, obtained uh, COVID-19 as a result of exposure on public transport? I think the, the question about how or when the exposure occurred is really one for health. Um, uh, often this is a precautionary method, measure, method uh, to ensure that if we know someone who is COVID positive, use public transport, uh, we work with health and understanding who was impacted and who could have been casual or close contacts. It's not necessarily, and certainly our discussions with so other... Have you made any inquiries of health yourself, or is it the case that you just were watching the press conferences to find out? No, we work very closely, as you say, Mr. Bookie, we work very closely with health every day. We understand so do you know? if, there's in, if there's any information provided to us which does indicate that. So far, our task force has worked very closely. Um, and as far as I'm aware, not aware of any specific uh, uh, infection being transmitted by public transport. Okay. Can I just move to Mr. Regan, please, about some questions about the Orchard Hills acquisitions? Uh, are you still acquiring properties from Orchard Hills, families and businesses uh, during this lockdown? Uh, Andrew Regan, uh, thank you for that question. Um, as you're probably aware, we have uh, been in discussions uh, with um, a range of property owners for the Metro Western Sydney Airport project, um, including um, around 19 properties um, at Orchard Hills. Um, those uh, discussions and the opportunity to continue uh, to try and reach agreement uh, with those owners um, are continuing. Um, and certainly we are still working um, with those owners uh, to try and reach agreement on valuation. Um, each of the owners have been given the opportunity to have uh, an independent valuation uh, paid for by Metro to assist them in that process. I'm aware. And that process yeah, thank you. I'm aware of that. Can I just get the latest update, though? Just during the lockdown period, of the 19 that you just made reference to, Mr. Regan, uh, how many of them have elected to have a determination by the Valuer General? And then I'll, that's my last question. I'll pass to my colleague after that. Um, so the process is ongoing, um, and uh, we're continuing to negotiate. Those properties have not yet been gazetted. Okay, can you just give me a notice the status of the 19, please, as to where they are up to in the process? That they're all at the same point in the process in that we are continuing to reach agreement um, and those processes have not yet uh, gone to the value general. If we are unable to reach agreement, uh, then that is the next step thank in the process. I'll pass my colleague. Great, thank you. I might uh, return to Mr. Carlin. Uh, thank you for that um, update on the uh, speeding cameras issue. Given that this, it turns out, was a own issue, and there have been negotiations with the company. Uh, have you briefed the minister or the minister's office about these transition issues with the contract that's been issued in the south of the state? Now, I think we've got you on mute again, Mr. Carlin. 
I think Carl and happy to take that on notice um, with regard to the briefings as to um, where this is managed in the regulatory operations area of the organisation, and um, I'll, I'll find that information for you. Yeah, so you're not, I just missed the start of that. So you're not able to tell us at the moment whether or not the minister or the minister's office have been briefed. I, again, I, yes, I'll take that on notice in order to just confirm. Thank you. Uh, could you also take on notice, given the answer you've given, how many hours, you've told us about the cars, how many hours of enforcement have occurred under the AccuCensus contract in the months of July and August? And then also what is projected uh, to unfold by way of hours for each of the remaining months of this year? Yes, happy to take that on notice um, and confirm. I can confirm that the 21,000 hours under the two contracts will be in place by the end of the year. Thank you. And the, um, the government publishes revenue figures for these uh, fines. I think that's to their credit that they these are published each month. Um, what we are less sure about is how many demerit points um, have been lost as a result of this rapid rise in the number of speeding fines due to the changes in these programs. How many demerit points have been lost since the changes to the program in November 2020? Uh, again, um, those details would be able to be discerned from the publicly available information with regard to the level of speeding on the revenue um, website. Um, but i um, happy to again take that on notice, noting that um, you know, we're in a situation again where, uh, as I've mentioned previously, 91% of people in our research indicate that they speed and you know, more than 20% say that they speed on every occasion that they drive. Uh, and that 44% you know, of our fatal crashes in, uh, involve yeah, people. Mr. Carl, I, I, I know you've speeding. been a strong advocate for the use yep. of these cameras. I do want to acknowledge yep. that um, publicly. Can you tell us? Uh, how many licences have been lost as a result of speeding fines linked to these, uh, the changes in the program since November 2020? Uh, Vernon Carlin. Uh, so I think that would be slightly confounded by, um, you know, the other offences that people actually um, have in regard to demerit points. Um, I can say that there's a, and, and again, this should be clearly available as well, the, those people who drive over 45 kilometres an hour over the speed limit who are detected by the cameras have their licence suspended for six months and um, you know, that information we can make readily available as well. Um, clearly there are examples where you know, the, you know, people are increasingly being caught by, as we expand this particular program, um, travelling at 80 kilometres over the speed limit. So I think you um, have taken that on. I think you've yes. taken that on notice, and I thank you um, for that. I might ask you um, uh, also to look at why there is some information available about this publicly uh, from the agency, but it's ceased publication in March this year. Could you um, a determine why that is, and b ensure that it is published uh, if it is? that it is. Sorry, could I just clarify the question? I'm referring to the um, uh, suspensions for, uh, demerit point suspensions for licences. Uh, which yes. have ceased yeah. to be published from Mark this year. Uh, so yes, I can take that on notice and take follow on up for you. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you. And now final question to Mr. Sharp. Um, I might just return to that issue about um, uh, vaccination and permits that my colleague was asking about right at the start and just ask for the broader transport industry. One of the concerns that's been raised is on Monday, some essential transport workers will not be working because they won't be able to meet the requirements. One estimate is it might be as much as a quarter of the workforce, given how concentrated these workers are in southwest and western Sydney. What modelling do you have or what uh, advice have you provided to help about the scale uh, of this issue come Monday when it comes to our freight and logistics industries? Uh, thank you for the question. 
Uh, we, we've been consulting uh, closely with uh, all our partners, including the construction industry and the freight industry. And also we've been uh, looking at this issue internally. Uh, so the public health order uh, has articulated the requirements uh, to reduce mobility out of the lockdown areas. And uh, clearly there are going to be implications uh, for industries. Uh, in terms of uh, consultation and feedback, I can confirm that uh, we have been engaged and we have uh, communicated that feedback through to health and our crisis um, uh, committees. And what does that modelling show? Is that quarter of workers out? Realistic, is that what you're hearing? No, I, I, I don't have a specific modelling. Uh, what we have done is engaged with the industry who have communicated uh, either concerns or suggestions on uh, mechanisms or exemptions. Uh, there's been various conversations and techniques used. Uh, off the back of that consultation, you may have seen that there was actually a deferral for uh, an additional week in regards to uh, the implementation, and that was uh, directly as a response to those engagements. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, that concludes um, the questioning for today's hearing. Thank you very much, government officers, for your attendance today. The committee secretariat will be in touch in the near future regarding any questions that you took on notice, um, as well as any supplementary questions. And can I take this opportunity to thank um, my fellow members, um, as well as um, most importantly, uh, the committee secretariat who have worked very hard to get these virtual um, hearings to work uh, pretty much seamlessly. So thank you very much to them. I know it's um, it's easy for us to just rock in here and, uh, um, and talk, but uh, I, do know and I'm very appreciative of the work you do behind the scenes. Um, thank you all. That's the end of our hearing.